The honeymoon was taking place in the bittersweet mysteries of Indian summer in New England. The lover's apartment had one romantic wall which was all French doors. They opened onto a balcony and the oily harbor beyond. A green and orange dragger, black in the night, grumbled and drummed past their balcony, not thirty feet from their wedding bed. It was going to sea with only its running lights on. Its empty holds were resonant, made the song of the engines rich and loud. The wharf began to sing the same song, and then the honeymooner's headboard sang too, and it continued to sing long after the dragger was gone. Thank you, said Valencia at last. The headboard was singing a mosquito song. You're welcome. It was nice. Then she began to cry. What's the matter? I'm so happy. Good. I never thought anybody would marry me. Hmm, said Billy Pilgrim. I'm going to lose weight for you, she said. What? I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going to become beautiful for you. I like you just the way you are. Do you really? Really, said Billy Pilgrim. He had already seen a lot of their marriage, thanks to time travel, knew that it was going to be at least bearable all the way. A great motor yacht named the Scheherazade now slid past the marriage bed. The song its engine sang was a very low organ note. All her lights were on. Two beautiful people, a young man and a young woman in evening clothes, were at the rail in the stern, loving each other, and their dreams and the wake. They were honeymooning, too. They were Lance Rumford of Newport, Rhode Island, and his bride, the former Cynthia Landry, who had been a childhood sweetheart of John F. Kennedy in Hyannisport, Massachusetts. There was a slight coincidence here. Billy Pilgrim would later share a hospital room with Rumford's uncle, Professor Bertram Copeland Rumford of Harvard, official historian of the United States Air Force. When the beautiful people were passed, Valencia questioned her funny-looking husband about war. It was a simple-minded thing for a female earthling to do, to associate sex and glamour with war. Do you ever think about the war, she said, laying a hand on his thigh. Sometimes, said Billy Pilgrim. I look at you sometimes, said Valencia, and I get a funny feeling that you're just full of secrets. I'm not, said Billy. This was a lie, of course. He hadn't told anybody about all the time traveling he'd done, about Trofamador and so on. You must have secrets about the war, or not secrets, I guess, but things you don't want to talk about. I'm proud you were a soldier. Do you know that? Good. Was it awful? Sometimes. A crazy thought now occurred to Billy. The truth of it startled him. It would make a good epitaph for Billy Pilgrim. And for me, too. Would you talk about the war now, if I wanted you to? said Valencia. In a tiny cavity in her great body, she was assembling the materials for a green beret. It would sound like a dream, said Billy. Other people's dreams aren't very interesting, usually. I heard you tell father one time about a German firing squad. She was referring to the execution of poor old Edgar Derby. Um, you had to bury him? Yes. Did he see you with your shovels before he was shot? Yes. Did he say anything? No. Was he scared? They had him doped up. He was sort of glassy-eyed. And they pinned a target to him? A piece of paper, said Billy. He got out of bed, said excuse me, went into the darkness of the bathroom to take a leak. He groped for the light, realized as he felt the rough walls that he had traveled back to 1944 to the prison hospital again. The candle in the hospital had gone out. 
Poor old Edgar Derby had fallen asleep on the cot next to Billy's. Billy was out of bed, groping along a wall, trying to find a way out because he had to take a leak so badly. He suddenly found a door, which opened, let him reel out into the prison night. Billy was loony with time travel and morphine. He delivered himself to a barbed wire fence which snagged him in a dozen places. Billy tried to back away from it, but the barbs wouldn't let go. So Billy did a silly little dance with the fence, taking a step this way, then that way, then returning to the beginning again. A Russian, himself out in the night to take a leak, saw Billy dancing from the other side of the fence. He came over to the curious scarecrow, tried to talk with it gently, asked it what country it was from. The scarecrow paid no attention, went on dancing. So the Russian undid the snags one by one, and the scarecrow danced off into the night again without a word of thanks. The Russian waved to him and called after him in Russian, goodbye. Billy took his pecker out there in the prison night and peed and peed on the ground. Then he put it away again, more or less, and contemplated a new problem. Where had he come from? And where should he go now? Somewhere in the night, there were cries of grief. With nothing better to do, Billy shuffled in their direction. He wondered what tragedy so many had found to lament out of doors. Billy was approaching, without knowing it, the back of the latrine. It consisted of a one-rail fence with twelve buckets underneath it. The fence was sheltered on three sides by a screen of scrap lumber and flattened tin cans. The open side faced the black tar paper wall of the shed where the feast had taken place. Billy moved along the screen and reached a point where he could see a message freshly painted on the tar paper wall. The words were written with the same pink paint which had brightened the set for Cinderella. Billy's perceptions were so unreliable that he saw the words as hanging in the air, painted on a transparent curtain, perhaps and there were lovely silver dots on the curtain, too. These were really nail heads holding the tar paper to the shed. Billy could not imagine how the curtain was supported in nothingness, and he supposed that the magic curtain and the theatrical grief were part of some religious ceremony he knew nothing about. Here is what the message said. Please leave this latrine as tidy as you found it. Billy looked inside the latrine. The wailing was coming from in there. The place was crammed with Americans who had taken their pants down. The welcome feast had made them as sick as volcanoes. The buckets were full or had been kicked over. An American near Billy wailed that he had excreted everything but his brains. Moments later, he said, There they go, there they go. He meant his brains. That was I, that was me. That was the author of this book. Billy reeled away from his vision of hell. He passed three Englishmen who were watching the excrement festival from a distance. They were catatonic with disgust. Button your pants, said one as Billy went by. So Billy buttoned his pants. He came to the door of the little hospital by accident. He went through the door and found himself honeymooning again, going from the bathroom back to bed with his bride on Cape Ann. I missed you, said Valencia. I missed you, said Billy Pilgrim. Billy and Valencia went to sleep nestled like spoons, and Billy traveled in time back to the train ride he had taken in 1944, from maneuvers in South Carolina to his father's funeral in Ilium. He hadn't seen Europe or combat yet. This was still in the days of steam locomotives. Billy had to change trains a lot. All the trains were slow. The coaches stunk of coal smoke and rationed tobacco and rationed booze and the farts of people eating wartime food. The upholstery of the iron seats was bristly, and Billy couldn't sleep much. He got to sleep soundly when he was only three hours from Ilium, with his legs splayed toward the entrance of the busy dining car. The porter woke him up when the train reached Ilium. Billy staggered off with his duffel bag, and then he stood on the station platform next to the porter, trying to wake up. Have a good nap, did you? said the porter. Yes, said Billy. Man, said the porter. 
you sure had a heart on. At three in the morning, on Billy's morphine night in prison, a new patient was carried into the hospital by two lusty Englishmen. He was tiny. He was Paul Lazaro, the polka-dotted car thief from Cicero, Illinois. He had been caught stealing cigarettes from under the pillow of an Englishman. The Englishman, half asleep, had broken Lazaro's right arm and knocked him unconscious. The Englishman who had done this was helping to carry Lazaro in now. He had fiery red hair and no eyebrows. He had been Cinderella's blue fairy godmother in the play. Now he supported his half of Lazaro with one hand while he closed the door behind himself with the other. Doesn't weigh as much as a chicken, he said. The Englishman with Lazaro's feet was the colonel who had given Billy his knockout shot. The blue fairy godmother was embarrassed and angry too. If I had known I was fighting a chicken, he said, I wouldn't have fought so hard. Hmm. The blue fairy godmother spoke frankly about how disgusting all the Americans were. Weak, smelly, self-pitying, a pack of sniveling, dirty, thieving bastards, he said. They're worse than the bleeding Russians. Do seem a scruffy lot, the colonel agreed. A German major came in now. He considered the Englishmen as close friends. He visited them nearly every day, played games with them, lectured to them on German history, played their piano, gave them lessons in conversational German. He told them often that, if it weren't for their civilized company, he would go mad. His English was splendid. He was apologetic about the Englishman's having to put up with the American enlisted men. He promised them that they would not be inconvenienced for more than a day or two, that the Americans would soon be shipped to Dresden as contract labor. He had a monograph with him, published by the German Association of Prison Officials. It was a report on the behavior in Germany of American enlisted men as prisoners of war. It was written by a former American who had risen high in the German Ministry of Propaganda. His name was Howard W. Campbell, Jr. He would later hang himself while awaiting trial as a war criminal. So it goes. While the British colonels set Lazaro's broken arm and mixed plaster for the cast, the German major translated out loud passages from Howard W. Campbell Jr.'s monograph. Campbell had been a fairly well-known playwright at one time. His opening line was this one. America is the wealthiest nation on earth, but its people are mainly poor, and poor Americans are urged to hate themselves. To quote the American humorist Ken Hubbard, it ain't no disgrace to be poor, but it might as well be. It is in fact a crime for an American to be poor, even though America is a nation of poor. Every other nation has folk traditions of men who were poor, but extremely wise and virtuous, and therefore more estimable than anyone with power and gold. No such tales are told by the American poor. They mock themselves and glorify their betters. The meanest eating or drinking establishment owned by a man who is himself poor is very likely to have a sign on its wall asking this cruel question. If you're so smart, why ain't you rich? There will also be an American flag, no larger than a child's hand, glued to a lollipop stick and flying from the cash register. The author of the monograph, a native of Schenectady, New York, was said by some to have the highest IQ of all the war criminals who were made to face a death by hanging. So it goes. Americans, like human beings everywhere, believe many things that are obviously untrue, the monograph went on. Their most destructive untruth is that it is very easy for any American to make money. They will not acknowledge how in fact hard money is to come by, and therefore those who have no money blame and blame and blame themselves. This inward blame has been a treasure for the rich and powerful, who have had to do less for their poor publicly and privately than any other ruling class since, say, Napoleonic times. Many novelties have come from America. The most startling of these, a thing without precedent, is a mass of undignified poor. They do not love one another because they do not love themselves. Once this is understood, 
the disagreeable behavior of American enlisted men in German prisons ceases to be a mystery. Howard W. Campbell, Jr. now discussed the uniform of the American enlisted in World War II. Every other army in history, prosperous or not, has attempted to clothe even its lowliest soldiers so as to make them impressive to themselves and others as stylish experts in drinking and copulation and looting and sudden death. The American army, however, sends its enlisted men out to fight and die in a modified business suit quite evidently made for another man, a sterilized but unpressed gift from a nose-holding charity which passes out clothing to drunks in the slums. When a dashingly clad officer addresses such a frumpishly dressed bum, he scolds him, as an officer in any army must. But the officer's contempt is not, as in other armies, a vuncular theatricality. It is a genuine expression of hatred for the poor, who have no one to blame for their misery but themselves. A prison administrator dealing with captured American enlisted men for the first time should be warned. Expect no brotherly love, even between brothers. There will be no cohesion between the individuals. Each will be a sulky child who often wishes he were dead. Campbell told what the German experience with captured American enlisted men had been. They were known everywhere to be the most self-pitying, least fraternal, and dirtiest of all prisoners of war, said Campbell. They were incapable of concerted action on their own behalf. They despised any leader from among their own number, refused to follow or even listen to him on the grounds that he was no better than they were, that he should stop putting on airs. And so on. Billy Pilgrim went to sleep, woke up as a widower in his empty home in Ilium. His daughter Barbara was reproaching him for writing ridiculous letters to the newspapers. Did you hear what I said? Barbara inquired. It was 1968 again. Of course. He had been dozing. If you're going to act like a child, maybe we'll just have to treat you like a child. That isn't what happens next, said Billy. We'll see what happens next. Big Barbara now embraced herself. It's awfully cold in here. Is the heat on? The heat? The furnace, the thing in the basement, the thing that makes hot air that comes out of these registers? I don't think it's working. Maybe not. Aren't you cold? I hadn't noticed. Oh, my God. You are a child. If we leave you alone here, you'll freeze to death. You'll starve to death. And so on. It was very exciting for her, taking his dignity away in the name of love. Barbara called the oil burner man, and she made Billy go to bed, made him promise to stay under the electric blanket until the heat came on. She set the control of the blanket at the highest notch, which soon made Billy's bed hot enough to bake bread in. When Barbara left, slamming the door behind her, Billy traveled in time to the zoo in Trofamador again. A mate had just been brought to him from Earth. She was Montana Wild Hack a motion picture star. Montana was under heavy sedation. Tralfamadorians wearing gas masks brought her in, put her on Billy's yellow lounge chair, withdrew through his airlock. The vast crowd outside was delighted. All attendance records for the zoo were broken. Everybody on the planet wanted to see the earthling's mate. Montana was naked, and so was Billy, of course. He had a tremendous wang, incidentally. You never know who'll get one. Now she fluttered her eyelids. Her lashes were like buggy whips. Where am I? She said. Everything is all right, said Billy gently. Please don't be afraid. Montana had been unconscious during her trip from Earth. The Tralfamadorians hadn't talked to her, hadn't shown themselves to her. The last thing she'd remembered was sunning herself by a swimming pool in Palm Springs, California. Montana was only 20 years old. Around her neck was a silver chain with a heart-shaped locket hanging from it, between her breasts. 
Now she turned her head to see the myriads of Tralfamadorians outside the dome. They were applauding her by opening and closing their little green hands quickly. Montana screamed and screamed. All the little green hands closed tight because Montana's terror was so unpleasant to see. The head zookeeper ordered a crane operator who was standing by to drop a navy blue canopy over the dome, thus simulating earthling night inside. Real night came to the zoo for only one earthling hour out of every 62. Billy switched on the floor lamp. The light from the single source threw the baroque detailing of Montana's body into sharp relief. Billy was reminded of fantastic architecture in Dresden before it was bombed. In time, Montana came to love and trust Billy Pilgrim. He did not touch her until she made it clear that she wanted him to. After she had been on Tralfamador for what would have been an earthling week, she asked him shyly if he wouldn't sleep with her, which he did. It was heavenly. And Billy traveled in time from that delightful bed to a bed in 1968. It was his bed in Ilium, and the electric blanket was turned up high. He was drenched in sweat, remembered groggily that his daughter had put him to bed, had told him to stay there until the oil burner was repaired. Somebody was knocking on his bedroom door. Yes, said Billy. Oil burner man. Yes? It's running good now. Heat's coming up. Good. Mouse ate through a wire from the thermostat. I'll be darned. Billy sniffed. His hot bed smelled like a mushroom cellar. He had had a wet dream about Montana Wild Hack. On the morning after that wet dream, Billy decided to go back to work in his office in the shopping plaza. Business was booming as usual. His assistants were keeping up with it nicely. They were startled to see him. They had been told by his daughter that he might never practice again. But Billy went into his examining room briskly, asked that the first patient be sent in. So they sent him one, a 12-year-old boy who was accompanied by his widowed mother. They were strangers, new in town. Billy asked them a little about themselves, learned that the boy's father had been killed in Vietnam in the famous five-day battle for Hill 875 near Dacto. So it goes. While he examined the boy's eyes, Billy told him matter-of-factly about his adventures on Tralfamador, assured the fatherless boy that his father was very much alive still in moments the boy would see again and again. Isn't that comforting? Billy asked. And somewhere in there, the boy's mother went out and told the receptionist that Billy was evidently going crazy. Billy was taken home. His daughter asked him again, Father, 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 what are we going to do with you? Listen, Billy Pilgrim says he went to Dresden, Germany on the day after his morphine night in the British compound in the center of the extermination camp for Russian prisoners of war. Billy woke up at dawn on that day in January. There were no windows in the little hospital, and the ghostly candles had gone out. So the only light came from the pin-prick holes in the walls and from a sketchy rectangle that outlined the imperfectly fitted door. Little Paul Lazaro, with a broken arm, snored on one bed. Edgar Derby, the high school teacher who would eventually be shot, snored on the other. Billy sat up in bed. He had no idea what year it was or what planet he was on, whatever the planet's name was. It was cold. But it wasn't the cold that had awakened Billy. It was animal magnetism which was making him shiver and itch. It gave him profound aches in his musculature, as though he had been exercising hard. The animal magnetism was coming from behind him. If Billy had to guess as to the source, 
he would have said that there was a vampire bat hanging upside down on the wall behind him. Billy moved down toward the foot of his cot before turning to look at whatever it was. He didn't want the animal to drop into his face and maybe claw his eyes out or bite off his big nose. Then he turned. The source of the magnetism really did resemble a bat. It was Billy's impresario's coat with the fur collar. It was hanging from a nail. Billy now backed toward it again, looking at it over his shoulder, feeling the magnetism increase. Then he faced it, kneeling on his cot, dared to touch it here and there. He was seeking the exact source of the radiations. He found two small sources, two lumps an inch apart and hidden in the lining. One was shaped like a pea, the other was shaped like a tiny horseshoe. Billy received a message carried by the radiations. He was told not to find out what the lumps were. He was advised to be content with knowing that they could work miracles for him, provided he did not insist on learning their nature. That was all right with Billy Pilgrim. He was grateful. He was glad. Billy dozed, awakened in the prison hospital again. The sun was high. Outside were Golgotha sounds of strong men digging holes for upright timbers and hard, hard ground. Englishmen were building themselves a new latrine. They had abandoned their old latrine to the Americans and their theater, the place where the feast had been held too. Six Englishmen staggered through the hospital with a pool table on which several mattresses were piled. They were transferring it to living quarters attached to the hospital. They were followed by an Englishman dragging his mattress and carrying a dartboard. The man with the dartboard was the blue fairy godmother who had injured little Paul Lazaro. He stopped by Lazaro's bed, asked Lazaro how he was. Lazaro told him he was going to have him killed after the war. Oh, you made a big mistake, said Lazaro. Anybody touches me, he better kill me, or I'm going to have him killed. The blue fairy godmother knew something about killing. He gave Lazaro a careful smile. There is still time for me to kill you, he said, if you really persuade me that it's the sensible thing to do. Why don't you go fuck yourself? Don't think I haven't tried, the blue fairy godmother answered. The blue fairy godmother left, amused and patronizing. When he was gone, Lazaro promised Billy and poor old Edgar Derby that he was going to have revenge. And that revenge was sweet. It's the sweetest thing there is, said Lazaro. People fuck with me, he said, and Jesus Christ, are they ever fucking sorry. I laugh like hell. I don't care if it's a guy or a dame. If the President of the United States fucks around with me, I fix him good. You should have seen what I did to a dog one time. A dog? said Billy. Son of a bitch bit me, so I got me some steak, and I got me the spring out of a clock, and I cut that spring up into little pieces. I put points on the ends of the pieces. They were sharp as razor blades. I stuck them into the stick, way inside, and I went past where they had the dog tied up. He wanted to bite me again. I said to him, Come on, doggy, let's be friends. Let's not be enemies anymore. I'm not mad. He believed me. He did? I threw him the steak. He swallowed it down in one big gulp. I waited around for ten minutes. Now Lazaro's eyes twinkled. Blood started coming out of his mouth. He started crying, and he rolled on the ground as though the knives were on the outside of him instead of on the inside of him. Then he tried to bite out his own insides. I laughed, and I said to him, You got the right idea now. Tear your own guts out, boy. That's me in there with all those knives. So it goes. Anybody ever asks you what the sweetest thing in life is? Said Lazaro. It's revenge. When Dresden was destroyed later on, incidentally, Lazaro did not exult. He didn't have anything against the Germans, he said. Also, he said, 
He liked to take his enemies one at a time. He was proud of never having hurt an innocent bystander. Nobody ever got it from Lazaro, he said, who didn't have it coming. Poor old Edgar Derby, the high school teacher, got into the conversation now. He asked Lazaro if he planned to feed the blue fairy godmother clock springs and steak. Shit, said Lazaro. He's a pretty big man, said Derby, who, of course, was a pretty big man himself. Size don't mean a thing. You're going to shoot him? I'm going to have him shot, said Lazaro. He'll get home after the war. He'll be a big hero. The dames will be climbing all over him. He'll settle down. A couple of years will go by. And then one day, there'll be a knock on his door. He'll answer the door. And there'll be a stranger out there. The stranger will ask him if he's so-and-so. When he says he is, the stranger will say, Paul Lazaro sent me, and he'll pull out a gun and shoot his pecker off. The stranger will let him think a couple of seconds about who Paul Lazaro is and what life's going to be like without a pecker. Then he'll shoot him once in the guts and walk away. So it goes. Lazaro said that he could have anybody in the world killed for $1,000 plus traveling expenses. He had a list in his head, he said. Derby asked him who all was on the list. And Lazaro said, Just make fucking sure you don't get on it. Just don't cross me. That's all. There was a silence. And then he added, And don't cross my friends. You have friends? Derby wanted to know. In the war? Said Lazaro. Yeah, I had a friend in the war. He's dead. So it goes. That's too bad. Lazaro's eyes were twinkling again. Yeah, he was my buddy on the boxcar. His name was Roland Weary. He died in my arms. Now he pointed to Billy with his one mobile hand. He died on account of this silly cocksucker here. So I promised him I'd have this silly cocksucker shot after the war. Lazaro erased with his hand anything Billy Pilgrim might be about to say. Just forget about it, kid, he said. Enjoy life while you can. Nothing's going to happen for maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years. But let me give you a piece of advice. Whenever the doorbell rings, have somebody else answer the door. Billy Pilgrim says now that this really is the way he is going to die, too. As a time traveler, he has seen his own death many times, has described it to a tape recorder. The tape is locked up with his will and some other valuables in his safe deposit box at the Ilium Merchants National Bank and Trust, he says. I, Billy Pilgrim, the tape begins, will die, have died, and always will die on February 13th, 1976. At the time of his death, he says, he is in Chicago to address a large crowd on the subject of flying saucers and the true nature of time. His home is still in Ilium. He has had to cross three international boundaries in order to reach Chicago. The United States of America has been balkanized, has been divided into 20 petty nations so that it will never again be a threat to world peace. Chicago has been hydrogen bombed by angry Chinamen. So it goes. It's all brand new. Billy is speaking before a capacity audience in a baseball park, which is covered by a geodesic dome. The flag of the country is behind him. It is a Hereford bull on a field of green. Billy predicts his own death within an hour. He laughs about it, invites the crowd to laugh with him. It's high time I was dead, he says. Many years ago, he said, a certain man promised to have me killed. He is an old man now, living not far from here. He has read all the publicity associated with my appearance in your fair city. He is insane. Tonight, he will keep his promise. There are protests from the crowd. Billy Pilgrim rebukes them. If you protest, if you think that death is a terrible thing, then you have not understood a word I've said. Now he closes his speech, as he closes every speech, with these words. 
Farewell, hello, farewell, hello. There are police around him as he leaves the stage. They are there to protect him from the crush of popularity. No threats on his life have been made since 1945. The police offer to stay with him. They are floridly willing to stand in a circle around him all night with their zap guns drawn. No, no, says Billy serenely. It is time for you to go home to your wives and children, and it is time for me to be dead for a little while, and then live again. At that moment, Billy's high forehead is in the crosshairs of a high-powered laser gun. It is aimed at him from the darkened press box. In the next moment, Billy Pilgrim is dead. So it goes. So Billy experiences death for a while. It is simply violet light and a hum. There isn't anybody else there. Not even Billy Pilgrim is there. Then he swings back into life again, all the way back to an hour after his life was threatened by Lazaro in 1945. He has been told to get out of his hospital bed and dress, that he is well. He and Lazaro and poor old Edgar Derby are to join their fellows in the theater. There they will choose a leader for themselves by secret ballot in a free election. Billy and Lazaro and poor old Edgar Derby cross the prison yard to the theater now. Billy was carrying his little coat as though it were a lady's muff. It was wrapped around and around his hands. He was the central clown in an unconscious travesty of that famous oil painting, The Spirit of 76. Edgar Derby was writing letters home in his head, telling his wife that he was alive and well, that she shouldn't worry that the war was nearly over, that he would soon be home. Lazaro was talking to himself about people he was going to have killed after the war, and rackets he was going to work, and women he was going to make fucking, whether they wanted to or not. If he had been a dog in a city, a policeman would have shot him and sent his head to a laboratory to see if he had rabies. So it goes. As they neared the theater, they came upon an Englishman who was hacking a groove in the earth with the heel of his boot. He was marking the boundary between the American and English sections of the compound. Billy and Lazaro and Derby didn't have to ask what the line meant. It was a familiar symbol from childhood. The theater was paved with American bodies that nestled like spoons. Most of the Americans were in stupors or asleep. Their guts were fluttering dry. Close the fucking door, somebody said to Billy. Were you born in a barn? Billy closed it, took a hand from his muff, touched the stove. It was as cold as ice. The stage was still set for Cinderella. Azure curtains hung from arches which were shocking pink. There were golden thrones in the dummy clock whose hands were set at midnight. Cinderella's slippers, which were airman boots painted silver, were capsized side by side under a golden throne. Billy and poor old Edgar Derby and Lazaro had been in the hospital when the British passed out blankets and mattresses, so they had none. They had to improvise. The only space open to them was up on the stage, and they went up there, pulled the azure curtains down, made nests. Billy curled in his azure nest, found himself staring at Cinderella's silver boots under a throne, and then he remembered that his shoes were ruined, that he needed boots. He hated to get out of his nest, but he forced himself to do it. He crawled to the boots on all fours, sat, tried them on. The boots fit perfectly. Billy Pilgrim was Cinderella, and Cinderella was Billy Pilgrim. Somewhere in there was a lecture on personal hygiene by the head Englishman, and then a free election. At least half the Americans went on snoozing through it all. The Englishman got up on the stage, and he rapped on the arm of a throne with a swagger stick, called, Lads, 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 can I have your attention, please? And so on. What the Englishman said about survival was this. 
If you stop taking pride in your appearance, you will very soon die. He said that he had seen several men die in the following way. They ceased to stand up straight, then ceased to shave or wash, then ceased to get out of bed, then ceased to talk, then died. There is this much to be said for it. It is evidently a very easy and painless way to go. So it goes. The Englishman said that he, when captured, had made and kept the following vows to himself. To brush his teeth twice a day, to shave once a day, to wash his face and hands before every meal and after going to the latrine, to polish his shoes once a day, to exercise for at least half an hour each morning and then move his bowels, and to look into a mirror frequently, frankly evaluating his appearance, particularly with respect to posture. Billy Pilgrim heard all this while lying in his nest. He looked not at the Englishman's face, but at his ankles. I envy you, lads, said the Englishman. Somebody laughed. Billy wondered what the joke was. You lads are leaving this afternoon for Dresden, a beautiful city, I'm told. You won't be cooped up like us. You'll be out where the life is, and the food is certain to be more plentiful than here. If I may inject a personal note, it has been five years now since I have seen a tree or a flower or woman or child or a dog or a cat or a place of entertainment or a human being doing useful work of any kind. You needn't worry about bombs, by the way. Dresden is an open city. It is undefended and contains no war industries or troop concentrations of any importance. Somewhere in there, old Edgar Derby, was elected head American. The Englishman called for nominations from the floor, and there weren't any. So he nominated Derby, praising him for his maturity and long experience in dealing with people. There were no further nominations, so the nominations were closed. All in favor, two or three people said, aye. Then poor old Derby made a speech. He thanked the Englishman for his good advice, said he meant to follow it exactly. He said he was sure that all the other Americans would do the same. He said that his primary responsibility now was to make damn well sure that everybody got home safely. Go take a flying fuck at a rolling donut, murmured Paul Lazaro in his azure nest. Go take a flying fuck at the moon. The temperature climbed startlingly that day. The noontime was balmy. The Germans brought soup and bread in two-wheeled carts which were pulled by Russians. The Englishmen sent over real coffee and sugar and marmalade and cigarettes and cigars, and the doors of the theater were left open so the warmth could get in. The Americans began to feel much better. They were able to hold their food, and then it was time to go to Dresden. The Americans marched fairly stylishly out of the British compound. Billy Pilgrim again led the parade. He had silver boots now, and a muff, and a piece of azure curtain, which he wore like a toga. Billy still had a beard. So did poor old Edgar Derby, who was beside him. Derby was imagining letters to home, his lips working tremulously. Dear Margaret, we are leaving for Dresden today. Don't worry. It will never be bombed. It is an open city. There was an election at noon, and guess what? And so on. They came to the prison railroad yard again. They had arrived on only two cars. They would depart far more comfortably on four. They saw the dead hobo again. He was frozen stiff in the weeds beside the track. He was in a fetal position, trying, even in death, to nestle like a spoon with others. There were no others now. He was nestling with thin air and cinders. Somebody had taken his boots. His bare feet were blue and ivory. It was all right somehow, his being dead. So it goes. The trip to Dresden was a lark. It took only two hours. Shriveled little bellies were full. Sunlight and mild air came in through the ventilators. There were plenty of smokes from the Englishmen. The Americans arrived in Dresden at five in the afternoon. 
The boxcar doors were opened, and the doorways framed the loveliest city that most of the Americans had ever seen. The skyline was intricate and voluptuous, and enchanted and absurd. It looked like a Sunday school picture of heaven to Billy Pilgrim. Somebody behind him in the boxcar said, Oz. That was I. That was me. The only other city I'd ever seen was Indianapolis, Indiana. Every other big city in Germany had been bombed and burned ferociously. Dresden had not suffered so much as a cracked window pane. Sirens went off every day, screamed like hell and people went down into cellars and listened to radios there. The planes were always bound for someplace else. Leipzig, Chemnitz, Plauen, places like that. So it goes. Steam radiators still whistled cheerily in Dresden. Streetcars clanged. Telephones rang and were answered. Lights went on and off when switches were clicked. There were theaters and restaurants. There was a zoo. The principal enterprises of the city were medicine and food processing and the making of cigarettes. People were going home from work now in the late afternoon. They were tired. Eight Dresdeners crossed the steel spaghetti of the railroad yard. They were wearing new uniforms. They had been sworn into the army the day before. They were boys and men past middle age and two veterans who'd been shot to pieces in Russia. Their assignment was to guard 100 American prisoners of war who would work as contract labor. A grandfather and his grandson were in the squad. The grandfather was an architect. The eight were grim as they approached the boxcars containing their wards. They knew what sick and foolish soldiers they themselves appeared to be. One of them actually had an artificial leg and carried not only a loaded rifle, but a cane. Still, they were expected to earn obedience and respect from tall, cocky, murderous American infantrymen who had just come from all the killing at the front. And then they saw bearded Billy Pilgrim in his blue toga and silver shoes with his hands in a muff. He looked at least 60 years old, Next to Billy was little Paul Lazaro with a broken arm. He was fizzing with rabies. Next to Lazaro was the poor old high school teacher, Edgar Derby, mournfully pregnant with patriotism and middle age and imaginary wisdom, and so on. The eight ridiculous Dresdeners ascertained that these hundred ridiculous creatures really were American fighting men fresh from the front. They smiled, and then they laughed. Their terror evaporated. There was nothing to be afraid of. Here were more crippled human beings, more fools like themselves. Here was light opera. So out of the gate of the railroad yard and into the streets of Dresden marched the light opera. Billy Pilgrim was the star. He led the parade. Thousands of people were on the sidewalks going home from work. They were watery and putty-colored, having eaten mostly potatoes during the past two years. They had expected no blessings beyond the mildness of the day. Suddenly, here was fun. Billy did not meet many of the eyes that found him so entertaining. He was enchanted by the architecture of the city. Mary Amoretti wove garlands above windows, Roguish fawns and naked nymphs peeked down at Billy from festooned cornices. Stone monkeys frisked among scrolls and seashells and bamboo. Billy, with his memories of the future, knew that the city would be smashed to smithereens and then burned in about thirty more days. He knew, too, that most of the people watching him would soon be dead. So it goes and Billy worked his hands in his muff as he marched, his fingertips working there in the hot darkness of the muff, wanted to know what the two lumps in the lining of the little impresario's coat were. The fingertips got inside the lining. They palpated the lumps, the pea-shaped thing and the horseshoe-shaped thing. The parade had to halt by a busy corner. 
the traffic light was red. There at the corner, in the front rank of pedestrians, was a surgeon who had been operating all day. He was a civilian, but his posture was military. He had served in two world wars. The sight of Billy offended him, especially after he learned from the guards that Billy was an American. It seemed to him that Billy was in abominable taste. Suppose that Billy had gone to a lot of silly trouble to costume himself just so. The surgeon spoke English, and he said to Billy, I take it you find war a very comical thing. Billy looked at him vaguely. Billy had lost track momentarily of where he was or how he had gotten there. He had no idea that people thought he was clowning. It was fate, of course, which had costumed him. Fate and a feeble will to survive. Did you expect us to laugh? The surgeon asked him. The surgeon was demanding some sort of satisfaction. Billy was mystified. Billy wanted to be friendly, to help, if he could, but his resources were meager. His fingers now held the two objects from the lining of his coat. Billy decided to show the surgeon what they were. You thought we would enjoy being mocked, the surgeon said, and you feel proud to represent America as you do. Billy withdrew a hand from his muff, held it under the surgeon's nose. On his palm rested a two-carat diamond and a partial denture. The denture was an obscene little artifact, silver and pearl and tangerine. Billy smiled. The parade pranced, staggered, and reeled to the gate of the Dresden slaughterhouse, and then it went inside. The slaughterhouse wasn't a busy place anymore. Almost all the hooved animals in Germany had been killed and eaten and excreted by human beings, mostly soldiers. So it goes. The Americans were taken to the fifth building inside the gate. It was a one-story cement block cube with sliding doors in front and back. It had been built as a shelter for pigs about to be butchered. Now it was going to serve as a home away from home for 100 American prisoners of war. There were bunks in there, and two pot-bellied stoves and a water tap. Behind it was the latrine, which was a one-rail fence with buckets under it. There was a big number over the door of the building. The number was five. Before the Americans could go inside, their only English-speaking guard told them to memorize their simple address in case they got lost in the big city. Their address was this. Schlachthof Fumpf. Schlachthof meant slaughterhouse. Fumpf was good old five. Billy Pilgrim got into a chartered airplane in Ilium 25 years after that. He knew it was going to crash, but he didn't want to make a fool of himself by saying so. It was supposed to carry Billy and 28 other optometrists to a convention in Montreal. His wife, Valencia, was outside, and his father-in-law, Lionel Merble, was strapped to the seat beside him. Lionel Merble was a machine. Tralfamadorians, of course, say that every creature and plant in the universe is a machine. It amuses them that so many earthlings are offended by the idea of being machines. Outside the plane, the machine named Valencia Merble Pilgrim was eating a Peter Paul mound bar and waving bye-bye. The plane took off without incident. The moment was structured that way. There was a barbershop quartet on board. They were optometrists, too. They called themselves the FEBS, which was an acronym for Four-Eyed Bastards. When the plane was safely aloft, the machine that was Billy's father-in-law asked the quartet to sing his favorite song. They knew what song he meant, and they sang it, and it went like this. In my prison cell I sit with my breeches full of shit and my balls are bouncing gently on the floor and I see the bloody snag when she bit me in the bag 
Oh, I'll never fuck a Polak anymore. Billy's father-in-law laughed and laughed at that, and he begged the quartet to sing the other Polish song he liked so much. So they sang a song from the Pennsylvania coal mines that began, Me and Mike, we work in mine. Holy shit, we have good time. Once a week, we get our pay. Holy shit, no work next day. Speaking of people from Poland, Billy Pilgrim accidentally saw a pole hanged in public about three days after Billy got to Dresden. Billy just happened to be walking to work with some others shortly after sunrise, and they came to a gallows and a small crowd in front of a soccer stadium. The pole was a farm laborer who was being hanged for having had sexual intercourse with a German woman. So it goes. Billy, knowing the plane was going to crash pretty soon, closed his eyes, traveled in time back to 1944. He was back in the forest in Luxembourg again with the three musketeers. Roland Weary was shaking him, bogging his head against a tree. You guys go on without me, said Billy Pilgrim. The barbershop quartet on the airplane was singing, Wait till the sun shines, Nellie when the plane smacked into the top of Sugarbush Mountain in Vermont. Everybody was killed but Billy and the co-pilot. So it goes. The people who first got to the crash scene were young Austrian ski instructors from the famous ski resort below. They spoke to each other in German as they went from body to body. They wore black wind masks with two holes for their eyes and a red top knot. They looked like gollywogs, like white people pretending to be black for the laughs they could get. Billy had a fractured skull, but he was still conscious. He didn't know where he was. His lips were working, and one of the gollywogs put his ear close to them to hear what might be his dying words. Billy thought the gollywog had something to do with World War II, and he whispered to him his address, Schlachthof Funf. Billy was brought down Sugarbush Mountain on a toboggan. The gollywogs controlled it with ropes and yodeled melodiously for right of way. Near the bottom, the trail swooped around the pylons of a chairlift. Billy looked up at all the young people in bright, elastic clothing and enormous boots and goggles, bombed out of their skulls with snow, swinging through the sky in yellow chairs. He supposed that they were part of an amazing new phase of World War II. It was all right with him. Everything was pretty much all right with Billy. He was taken to a small private hospital. A famous brain surgeon came up from Boston and operated on him for three hours. Billy was unconscious for two days after that, and he dreamed millions of things, some of them true. The true things were time travel. One of the true things was his first evening in the slaughterhouse. He and poor old Edgar Derby were pushing an empty two-wheeled cart down a dirt lane between empty pens for animals. They were going to a communal kitchen for supper for all. They were guarded by a 16-year-old German named Werner Gluck. The axles of the cart were greased with the fat of dead animals. So it goes. The sun had just gone down, and its afterglow was backlighting the city, which formed low cliffs around the bucolic void to the idle stockyards. The city was blacked out because bombers might come, so Billy didn't get to see Dresden do one of the most cheerful things a city is capable of doing when the sun goes down, which is to wink its lights on one by one. There was a broad river to reflect those lights, which would have made their nighttime winkings very pretty indeed. It was the Elbe. Werner Gluck, the young guard, was a Dresden boy. He had never been in the slaughterhouse before, so he wasn't sure where the kitchen was. He was tall and weak like Billy, might have been a younger brother of his. They were, in fact, distant cousins, something they never found out. Gluck was armed with an incredibly heavy musket, a single-shot museum piece with an octagonal barrel and a smooth bore. 
He had fixed his bayonet. It was like a long knitting needle. It had no blood gutters. Gluck led the way to a building that he thought might contain the kitchen, and he opened the sliding door in its side. There wasn't a kitchen in there, though. There was a dressing room adjacent to a communal shower, and there was a lot of steam. In the steam were about 30 teenage girls with no clothes on. They were German refugees from Breslau, which had been tremendously bombed. They had just arrived in Dresden, too. Dresden was jammed with refugees. There those girls were, with all their private parts bare for anybody to see. And there in the doorway were Gluck and Derby and Pilgrim, the childish soldier and the poor old high school teacher and the clown in his toga and silver shoes, staring. The girls screamed. They covered themselves with their hands and turned their backs and so on and made themselves utterly beautiful. Werner Gluck, who had never seen a naked woman before, closed the door. Billy had never seen one either. It was nothing new to Derby. When the three fools found the communal kitchen, whose main job was to make lunch for workers in the slaughterhouse, everybody had gone home but one woman who had been waiting for them impatiently. She was a war widow. So it goes. She had her hat and coat on. She wanted to go home, too, even though there wasn't anybody there. Her white gloves were laid out side by side on the zinc countertop. She had two big cans of soup for the Americans. It was simmering over low fires in the gas range. She had stacks of loaves of black bread, too. She asked Gluck if he wasn't awfully young to be in the army. He admitted that he was. She asked Edgar Derby if he wasn't awfully old to be in the army. He said he was. She asked Billy Pilgrim what he was supposed to be. Billy said he didn't know. He was just trying to keep warm. All the real soldiers are dead, she said. It was true. So it goes. Another true thing that Billy saw while he was unconscious in Vermont was the work that he and the others had to do in Dresden during the month before the city was destroyed. They washed windows and swept floors and cleaned lavatories and put jars into boxes and sealed cardboard boxes in a factory that made malt syrup. The syrup was enriched with vitamins and minerals. The syrup was for pregnant women. The syrup tasted like thin honey laced with hickory smoke, and everybody who worked in the factory secretly spooned it all day long. They weren't pregnant, but they needed vitamins and minerals, too. Billy didn't spoon syrup on his first day at work, but lots of other Americans did. Billy spooned it on his second day. There were spoons hidden all over the factory, on rafters, in drawers, behind radiators, and so on. They had been hidden in haste by persons who had been spooning syrup who had heard somebody else coming. Spooning was a crime. On his second day, Billy was cleaning behind a radiator, and he found a spoon. To his back was a vat of syrup that was cooling. The only other person who could see Billy and his spoon was poor old Edgar Derby, who was washing a window outside. The spoon was a tablespoon. Billy thrust it into the vat, turned it around and around, making a gooey lollipop. He thrust it into his mouth. A moment went by, and then every cell in Billy's body shook him with ravenous gratitude and applause. There were diffident raps on the factory window. Derby was out there, having seen all. He wanted some syrup, too. So Billy made a lollipop for him. He opened the window. He stuck the lollipop into poor old Derby's gaping mouth. A moment passed, and then Derby burst into tears. Billy closed the window and hid the sticky spoon. Somebody was coming. The Americans in the slaughterhouse had a very interesting visitor two days before Dresden was destroyed. 
He was Howard W. Campbell, Jr., an American who had become a Nazi. Campbell was the one who had written the monograph about the shabby behavior of American prisoners of war. He wasn't doing more research about prisoners now. He had come to the slaughterhouse to recruit men for a German military unit called the Free American Corps. Campbell was the inventor and commander of the unit, which was supposed to fight only on the Russian front. Campbell was an ordinary-looking man, but he was extravagantly costumed in a uniform of his own design. He wore a white ten-gallon hat and black cowboy boots decorated with swastikas and stars. He was sheathed in a blue body stocking, which had yellow stripes running from his armpits to his ankles. His shoulder patch was a silhouette of Abraham Lincoln's profile on a field of pale green. He had a broad armband, which was red, with a blue swastika in a circle of white. He was explaining this armband now in the cement block hog barn. Billy Pilgrim had a boiling case of heartburn since he had been spooning malt syrup all day long at work. The heartburn brought tears to his eyes, so that his image of Campbell was distorted by jiggling lenses of salt water. Blue is for the American sky, Campbell was saying. White is for the race that pioneered the continent, drained the swamps and cleared the forests and built the roads and bridges. Red is for the blood of American patriots, which was shed so gladly in years gone by. Campbell's audience was sleepy. It had worked hard at the syrup factory, and then it had marched a long way home in the cold. It was skinny and hollow-eyed. Its skins were beginning to blossom with small sores. So were its mouths and throats and intestines. The malt syrup it spooned at the factory contained only a few of the vitamins and minerals every earthling needs. Campbell offered the Americans food now, steaks and mashed potatoes and gravy and mince pie, if they would join the Free American Corps. Once the Russians are defeated, he went on, you will be repatriated through Switzerland. There was no response. You're going to have to fight the communists sooner or later, said Campbell. Why not get it over with now? and then it developed that Campbell was not going to go unanswered after all. Poor old Derby, the doomed high school teacher, lumbered to his feet for what was probably the finest moment in his life. There are almost no characters in this story and almost no dramatic confrontations because most of the people in it are so sick and so much the listless playthings of enormous forces. One of the main effects of war, after all, is that people are discouraged from being characters. But old Derby was a character now. His stance was that of a punch-drunk fighter. His head was down. His fists were out front, waiting for information and battle plan. Derby raised his head, called Campbell a snake. He corrected that. He said that snakes couldn't help being snakes, and that Campbell who could help being what he was, was something much lower than a snake or a rat or even a blood-filled tick. Campbell smiled. Derby spoke movingly of the American form of government with freedom and justice and opportunities and fair play for all. He said there wasn't a man there who wouldn't gladly die for those ideals. He spoke of the brotherhood between the American and the Russian people and how those two nations were going to crush the disease of Nazism, which wanted to infect the whole world. The air raid sirens of Dresden howled mournfully. The Americans and their guards and Campbell took shelter in an echoing meat locker, which was hollowed in living rock under the slaughterhouse. There was an iron staircase with iron doors at the top and bottom. Down in the locker were a few cattle and sheep and pigs and horses hanging from iron hooks. So it goes. The locker had empty hooks for thousands more. It was naturally cool. There was no refrigeration. There was candlelight. 
The locker was whitewashed and smelled of carbolic acid. There were benches along the wall. The Americans went to these, brushing away flakes of whitewash before they sat down. Howard W. Campbell, Jr. remained standing, like the guards. He talked to the guards in excellent German. He had written many popular German plays and poems in his time and had married a famous German actress named Rezi North. She was dead now, had been killed while entertaining troops in the Crimea. So it goes. Nothing happened that night. It was the next night that about 130,000 people in Dresden would die. So it goes. Billy dozed in the meat locker. He found himself engaged again, word for word, gesture for gesture, in the argument with his daughter with which this tale began. Father, she said, what are we going to do with you? And so on. You know who I could just kill? She asked. Who could you kill? Said Billy. That Kilgore Trout. Kilgore Trout was and is a science fiction writer, of course. Billy has not only read dozens of books by Trout, he has also become Trout's friend, to the extent that anyone can become a friend of Trout, who is a bitter man. Trout lives in a rented basement in Ilium, about two miles from Billy's nice white home. He himself has no idea how many novels he has written, possibly 75 of the things. Not one of them has made money. So Trout keeps body and soul together as a circulation man for the Ilium Gazette, manages newspaper delivery boys, bullies and flatters and cheats little kids. Billy met him for the first time in 1964. Billy drove his Cadillac down a back alley in Ilium, and he found his way blocked by dozens of boys in their bicycles. A meeting was in progress. The boys were harangued by a man in a full beard, he was cowardly and dangerous and obviously very good at his job. Trout was 62 years old back then. He was telling the kids to get off their dead butts and get their daily customers to subscribe to the fucking Sunday edition, too. He said that whoever sold the most Sunday subscriptions during the next two months would get a free trip for himself and his parents to Martha's fucking vineyard for a week, all expenses paid, and so on. One of the newspaper boys was actually a newspaper girl. She was electrified. Trout's paranoid face was terribly familiar to Billy, who had seen it on the jackets of so many books. But coming upon that face suddenly in a hometown alley, Billy could not guess why the face was familiar. Billy thought maybe he had known this cracked messiah in Dresden somewhere. Trout certainly looked like a prisoner of war. And then the newspaper girl held up her hand. Mr. Trout, she said, if I win, can I take my sister too? Hell no, said Kilgore Trout. You think money grows on trees? Trout, incidentally, had written a book about a money tree. It had $20 bills for leaves. Its flowers were government bonds. Its fruit was diamonds. It attracted human beings who killed each other around the roots and made very good fertilizer. So it goes. Billy Pilgrim parked his Cadillac in the alley and waited for the meeting to end. When the meeting broke up, there was still one boy Trout had to deal with. The boy wanted to quit because the work was so hard and the hours were so long and the pay was so small. Trout was concerned because if the boy really quit, Trout would have to deliver the boy's route himself until he could find another sucker. What are you? Trout asked the boy scornfully. Some kind of gutless wonder? This too was the title of a book by Trout, The Gutless Wonder. It was about a robot who had bad breath, who became popular after his halitosis was cured. But what made the story remarkable, since it was written in 1932, 
was that it predicted the widespread use of burning jellied gasoline on human beings. It was dropped on them from airplanes. Robots did the dropping. They had no conscience and no circuits which would allow them to imagine what was happening to the people on the ground. Trout's leading robot looked like a human being and could talk and dance and so on and go out with girls, and nobody held it against him that he dropped jellied gasoline on people. But they found his halitosis unforgivable. But then he cleared that up, and he was welcome to the human race. Trout lost his argument with the boy who wanted to quit. He told the boy about all the millionaires who had carried newspapers as boys, and the boy replied, Yeah, but I bet they quit after a week. It's such a royal screwing. And the boy left his full newspaper bag at Trout's feet, with the customer book on top. It was up to Trout to deliver these papers. He didn't have a car. He didn't even have a bicycle. And he was scared to death of dogs. Somewhere, a big dog barked. As Trout lugubriously slung the bag from his shoulder, Billy Pilgrim approached him. Mr. Trout? Yes. Are, are you Kilgore Trout? Yes. Trout supposed that Billy had some complaint about the way his newspapers were being delivered. He did not think of himself as a writer for the simple reason that the world had never allowed him to think of himself in this way. The, the writer, said Billy. The what? Billy was certain that he had made a mistake. There's a writer named Kilgore Trout. There is? Trout looked foolish and dazed. You never heard of him? Trout shook his head. Nobody. Nobody ever did. Billy helped Trout deliver his papers, driving him from house to house in the Cadillac. Billy was the responsible one, finding the houses, checking them off. Trout's mind was blown. He had never met a fan before, and Billy was such an avid fan. Trout told him that he had never seen a book of his advertised, reviewed, or on sale. All these years, he said, I've been opening the window and making love to the world. You must surely have gotten letters, said Billy. I felt like writing you letters many times. Trout held up a single finger. One. Was it enthusiastic? It was insane. The writer said I should be president of the world. It turned out, that the person who had written this letter was Elliot Rosewater, Billy's friend in the veterans' hospital near Lake Placid. Billy told Trout about Rosewater. My God, I thought he was about 14 years old, said Trout, a full-grown man, a captain in the war. He writes like a 14-year-old, said Kilgore Trout. Billy invited Trout to his 18th wedding anniversary, which was only two days hence. Now the party was in progress. Trout was in Billy's dining room, gobbling canapes. He was talking with a mouthful of Philadelphia cream cheese and salmon roe to an optometrist's wife. Everybody at the party was associated with optometry in some way, except Trout, and he alone was without glasses. He was making a great hit. Everybody was thrilled to have a real author at the party even though they had never read his books. Trout was talking to a Maggie White, who had given up being a dental assistant to become a homemaker for an optometrist. She was very pretty. The last book she had read was Ivanhoe. Billy Pilgrim stood nearby, listening. He was palpating something in his pocket. It was a present he was about to give his wife a white satin box containing a star sapphire cocktail ring. The ring was worth $800. The adulation that Trout was receiving, mindless and illiterate as it was, affected Trout like marijuana. He was happy and loud and impudent. I'm afraid I don't read as much as I ought to, said Maggie. We're all afraid of something, Trout replied. I'm afraid of cancer and rats and Doberman pinchers. I should know, but I don't, so I have to ask, said Maggie. 
what's the most famous thing you ever wrote? It was about a funeral for a great French chef. That sounds interesting. All the great chefs in the world are there. It's a beautiful ceremony. Trout was making this up as he went along. Just before the casket is closed, the mourners sprinkle parsley and paprika on the deceased. So it goes. Did that really happen? said Maggie White. She was a dull person, but a sensational invitation to make babies. Men looked at her and wanted to fill her up with babies right away. She hadn't even one baby yet. She used birth control. Of course it happened, Trout told her. If I wrote something that hadn't really happened and I tried to sell it, I could go to jail. That's fraud. Maggie believed him. I'd never thought about that before. Think about it now. It's like advertising. You have to tell the truth in advertising or you get in trouble. Exactly. The same body of law applies. Do you think you might put us in a book sometime? I put everything that happens to me in books. I guess I better be careful what I say. That's right. And I'm not the only one who's listening. God is listening, too. And on Judgment Day, he's going to tell you all the things you said and did. And if it turns out they're bad things instead of good things, that's too bad for you, because you'll burn forever and ever. The burning never stops hurting. Poor Maggie turned gray. She believed that, too, and was petrified. Kilgore Trout laughed uproariously. A salmon egg flew out of his mouth and landed in Maggie's cleavage. Now an optometrist called for attention. He proposed a toast to Billy and Valencia, whose anniversary it was. According to plan, the barbershop quartet of optometrists, the Febs, sang while people drank and Billy and Valencia put their arms around each other, just glowed. Everybody's eyes were shining. The song was, That Old Gang of Mine. Gee, that song went, but I'd give the world to see that old gang of mine, and so on. A little later it said, So long forever, old fellows and gals. So long forever, old sweethearts and pals. God bless em. And so on. Unexpectedly, Billy Pilgrim found himself upset by the song and the occasion. He had never had an old gang, old sweethearts and pals, but he missed one anyway, as the quartet made slow, agonized experiments with chords. Chords intentionally sour, sourer still, unbearably sour, and then a chord that was suffocatingly sweet, and then some sour ones again, Billy had powerful psychosomatic responses to the changing chords. His mouth filled with the taste of lemonade, and his face became grotesque, as though he really were being stretched on the torture engine called the rack. He looked so peculiar that several people commented on it solicitously when the song was done. They thought he might have been having a heart attack, and Billy seemed to confirm this by going to a chair and sitting down haggardly. There was silence. Oh, my God, said Valencia, leaning over him. Billy, are you all right? Yes. You look so awful. Really, I'm okay. And he was, too, except that he could find no explanation for why the song had affected him so grotesquely. He had supposed for years that he had no secrets from himself. Here was proof that he had a great big secret somewhere inside, and he could not imagine what it was. People drifted away now, seeing the color return to Billy's cheeks, seeing him smile. Valencia stayed with him, and Kilgore Trout, who had been on the fringe of the crowd, came closer, interested, shrewd. 
You looked as though you'd seen a ghost, said Valencia. No, said Billy. He hadn't seen anything but what was really before him. The faces of the four singers, those four ordinary men, cow-eyed and mindless and anguished as they went from sweetness to sourness to sweetness again. Can I make a guess, said Kilgore Trout. You saw through a time window. A what? said Valencia. He suddenly saw the past to the future. Am I right? No, said Billy Pilgrim. He got up, put a hand into his pocket, found the box containing the ring in there. He took out the box, gave it absently to Valencia. He had meant to give it to her at the end of the song while everybody was watching. Only Kilgore Trout was there to see. For me, said Valencia. Yes. Oh, my God, she said. Then she said it louder, so other people heard. They gather around, and she opened it, and she almost screamed when she saw the sapphire with the star in it. Oh, my God, she said. She gave Billy a big kiss. She said, thank you, thank you, thank you. There was a lot of talk about what wonderful jewelry Billy had given to Valencia over the years. My God, said Maggie White, she's already got the biggest diamond I ever saw outside of a movie. She was talking about the diamond Billy had brought back from the war. The partial denture he had found inside his little impresario's coat, incidentally, was in his cufflinks box in his dresser drawer. Billy had a wonderful collection of cufflinks. It was the custom of the family to give him cufflinks on every Father's Day. He was wearing Father's Day cufflinks now. They had cost over $100. They were made out of ancient Roman coins. He had one pair of cufflinks upstairs, which were little roulette wheels that really worked. He had another pair, which had a real thermometer in one, and a real compass in the other. Billy now moved about the party, outwardly normal. Kilgore Trout was shadowing him, keen to know what Billy had suspected or seen. Most of Trout's novels, after all, dealt with time warps and extrasensory perception and other unexpected things. Trout believed in things like that, was greedy to have their existence proved. You ever put a full-length mirror on the floor and then have a dog stand on it? Trout asked Billy. No. The dog will look down, and all of a sudden he'll realize there's nothing under him. He thinks he's standing on thin air. He'll jump a mile. He will? That's how you looked. As though you all of a sudden realized you were standing on thin air. The barbershop quartet sang again. Billy was emotionally racked again. The experience was definitely associated with those four men and not what they sang. Here is what they sang while Billy was pulled apart inside. Eleven cent cotton, forty cent meat. How in the world can a poor man eat? Pray for the sunshine, cause it will rain. Things getting worse driving all insane. Built a nice bar, painted it brown. Lightning came along and burn it down. No use talking, any man's beat, with 11 cent cotton and 40 cent meat. 11 cent cotton, a car load of tax, the load's too heavy for our poor backs. And so on. Billy fled upstairs in his nice white home. Trout would have come upstairs with him if Billy hadn't told him not to. Then Billy went into the upstairs bathroom, which was dark. He closed and locked the door. He left it dark and gradually became aware that he was not alone. His son was in there. Dad, his son said in the dark. Robert, the future Green Beret, was 17 then. Billy liked him, but didn't know him very well. Billy couldn't help suspecting that there wasn't much to know about Robert. Billy flicked on the light. 
Robert was sitting on the toilet with his pajama bottoms around his ankles. He was wearing an electric guitar slung around his neck on a strap. He had just bought the guitar that day. He couldn't play it yet and, in fact, never learned to play it. It was anacreous pink. Hello, son, said Billy Pilgrim. Billy went into his bedroom, even though there were guests to be entertained downstairs. He lay down on his bed, turned on the magic fingers. The mattress trembled, drove a dog out from under the bed. The dog was Spot. Good old Spot was still alive in those days. Spot lay down again in a corner. Billy thought hard about the effect the quartet had had on him and then found an association with an experience he had had long ago. He did not travel in time to the experience. He remembered it, shimmeringly, as follows. He was down in the meat locker on the night that Dresden was destroyed. There were sounds like giant footsteps above. Those were sticks of high explosive bombs. The giants walked and walked. The meat locker was a very safe shelter. All that happened down there was an occasional shower of calcimine. The Americans and four of their guards and a few dressed carcasses were down there and nobody else. The rest of the guards had, before the raid began, gone to the comforts of their own homes in Dresden. They were all being killed with their families. So it goes. The girls that Billy had seen naked were all being killed too, in a much shallower shelter in another part of the stockyards. So it goes. A guard would go to the head of the stairs every so often to see what it was like outside. Then he would come down and whisper to the other guards. There was a firestorm out there. Dresden was one big flame. The one flame ate everything organic, everything that would burn. It wasn't safe to come out of the shelter until noon the next day. When the Americans and their guards did come out, the sky was black with smoke. The sun was an angry little pinhead. Dresden was like the moon now nothing but minerals. The stones were hot. Everybody else in the neighborhood was dead. So it goes. The guards drew together instinctively, rolled their eyes. They experimented with one expression and then another, said nothing, though their mouths were often open. They looked like a silent film of a barbershop quartet, so long forever they might have been singing, old fellows and pals. So long forever, old sweethearts and pals. God bless them. story, Montana Wild Hack said to Billy Pilgrim in the Tralfamadorian Zoo one time. They were in bed side by side. They had privacy. The canopy covered the dome. Montana was six months pregnant now, big and rosy, lazily demanding small favors from Billy from time to time. She couldn't send Billy out for ice cream or strawberries since the atmosphere outside the dome was cyanide and the nearest strawberries and ice cream were millions of light years away. She could send him to the refrigerator, which was decorated with the blank couple on the bicycle built for two, or, as now, she could wheedle, Tell me a story, Billy boy. Dresden was destroyed on the night of February 13th, 1945. Billy Pilgrim began. We came out of our shelter the next day. He told Montana about the four guards, who in their astonishment and grief resembled a barbershop quartet. He told her about the stockyards with all the fence posts gone, with roofs and windows gone. Told her about seeing little logs lying around. These were people 
who had been caught in the firestorm. So it goes. Billy told her what had happened to the buildings that used to form cliffs around the stockyards. They had collapsed. Their wood had been consumed, and their stones had crashed down, had tumbled against one another until they locked at last in low and graceful curves. It was like the moon, said Billy Pilgrim. The guards told the Americans to form in ranks of four, which they did. Then they had them march back to the hog barn, which had been their home. Its walls still stood, but its windows and roof were gone, and there was nothing inside but ashes and dollops of melted glass. It was realized then that there was no food or water, and that the survivors, if they were going to continue to survive, were going to have to climb over curve after curve on the face of the moon, which they did. The curves were smooth only when seen from a distance. The people climbing them learned that they were treacherous, jagged things, hot to the touch, often unstable, eager, should certain important rocks be disturbed to tumble some more, to form lower, more solid curves. Nobody talked much as the expedition crossed the moon. There was nothing appropriate to say. One thing was clear. Absolutely everybody in the city was supposed to be dead, regardless of what they were, and anybody that moved in it represented a flaw in the design. There were to be no moon men at all. American fighter planes came in under the smoke to see if anything was moving. They saw Billy and the rest moving down there. Planes sprayed them with machine gun bullets, but the bullets missed. Then they saw some other people moving down by the riverside, and they shot at them. They hit some of them. So it goes. The idea was to hasten the end of the war. Billy's story ended very curiously in a suburb untouched by fire and explosions. The guards and the Americans came at nightfall to an inn which was open for business. There was candlelight. There were fires in three fireplaces downstairs. There were empty tables and chairs waiting for anyone who might come, and empty beds with covers turned down upstairs. There was a blind innkeeper and his sighted wife, who was the cook, and their two young daughters, who worked as waitresses and maids. This family knew that Dresden was gone. Those with eyes had seen it burn and burn, understood that they were on the edge of a desert now. Still, they had opened for business, had polished the glasses and wound the clocks and stirred the fires, and waited and waited to see who would come. There was no great flow of refugees from Dresden. The clocks ticked on, the fires crackled, the translucent candles dripped. And then there was a knock on the door, and in came four guards and one hundred American prisoners of war. The innkeeper asked the guards if they had come from the city. Yes. Are there more people coming? And the guards said that, on the difficult route, they had chosen. They had not seen another living soul. The blind innkeeper said that the Americans could sleep in his stable that night, and he gave them soup and ersatz coffee and a little beer. Then he came to the stable to listen to them bedding down in the straw. Good night, Americans, he said in German. Sleep well. Here is how Billy Pilgrim lost his wife, Valencia. He was unconscious in the hospital in Vermont after the airplane crashed on Sugarbush Mountain, and Valencia, having heard about the crash, was driving from Ilium to the hospital in the family Cadillac El Dorado Coupe de Ville. Valencia was hysterical because she had been told frankly that Billy might die or that if he lived, he might be a vegetable. Valencia adored Billy. 
She was crying and yelping so hard as she drove that she missed the correct turnoff from the throughway. She applied her power brakes and a Mercedes slammed into her from behind. Nobody was hurt, thank God, because both drivers were wearing seatbelts. Thank God, thank God. The Mercedes lost only a headlight, but the rear end of the Cadillac was a body and fender man's wet dream. The trunk and fenders were collapsed. The gaping trunk looked like the mouth of a village idiot who was explaining that he didn't know anything about anything. The fender shrugged. The bumper was at a high port arms. Reagan for president, a sticker on the bumper said. The back window was veined with cracks. The exhaust system rested on the pavement. The driver of the Mercedes got out and went to Valencia to find out if she was all right. She babbled hysterically about Billy and the airplane crash, and then she put her car in gear and crossed the median divider, leaving her exhaust system behind. When she arrived at the hospital, people rushed to the windows to see what all the noise was. The Cadillac, with both mufflers gone, sounded like a heavy bomber coming in on a wing and a prayer. Valencia turned off the engine, but then she slumped against the steering wheel and the horn brayed steadily. A doctor and a nurse ran out to find out what the trouble was. Poor Valencia was unconscious, overcome by carbon monoxide. She was a heavenly azure. One hour later, she was dead. So it goes. Billy knew nothing about it. He dreamed on and traveled in time and so forth. The hospital was so crowded that Billy couldn't have a room to himself. He shared a room with a Harvard University professor named Bertram Copeland Rumford. Rumford didn't have to look at Billy because Billy was surrounded by white linen screens on rubber wheels. But Rumford could hear Billy talking to himself from time to time. Rumford's left leg was in traction. He had broken it while skiing. He was 70 years old, but had the body and spirit of a man half that age. He had been honeymooning with his fifth wife when he broke his leg. Her name was Lily. Lily was 23. Just about the time poor Valencia was pronounced dead, Lily came into Billy's and Rumford's room with an armload of books. Rumford had sent her down to Boston to get them. He was working on a one-volume history of the United States Army Air Corps in World War II. The books were about bombings and sky battles that had happened before Lily was even born. You guys go on without me said Billy Pilgrim deliriously as pretty little Lily came in. She had been an a-go-go girl when Rumford saw her and resolved to make her his own. She was a high school dropout. Her IQ was 103. He scares me, she whispered to her husband about Billy Pilgrim. He bores the hell out of me, Rumford replied boomingly. All he does in his sleep is quit and surrender and apologize and ask to be left alone. Rumford was a retired brigadier general in the Air Force Reserve. The official Air Force historian, a full professor, the author of 26 books, a multimillionaire since birth, and one of the great competitive sailors of all time. His most popular book, was about sex and strenuous athletics for men over 65. Now he quoted Theodore Roosevelt, whom he resembled a lot. I could carve a better man out of a banana. One of the things Rumford had told Lily to get in Boston was a copy of President Harry S. Truman's announcement to the world that an atomic bomb had been dropped on Hiroshima. She had a Xerox of it, and Rumford asked her if she had read it. No, she didn't read well, which was one of the reasons she had dropped out of high school. Rumford ordered her to sit down 
and read the Truman Statement now. He didn't know that she couldn't read much. He knew very little about her, except that she was one more public demonstration that he was a Superman. So Lily sat down and pretended to read the Truman thing, which went like this. Sixteen hours ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima, an important Japanese army base. That bomb had more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. It had more than 2,000 times the blast power of the British Grand Slam, which is the largest bomb ever yet used in the history of warfare. The Japanese began the war from the air at Pearl Harbor. They have been repaid many fold, and the end is not yet. With this bomb, we have now added a new and revolutionary increase in destruction to supplement the growing power of our armed forces. In their present form, these bombs are now in production, and even more powerful forms are in development. It is an atomic bomb. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. The force from which the sun draws its power has been loosed against those who brought war to the Far East. Before 1939, it was the accepted belief of scientists that it was theoretically possible to release atomic energy, but nobody knew any practical method of doing it. By 1942, however, we knew that the Germans were working feverishly to find a way to add atomic energy to all the other engines of war with which they hoped to enslave the world. But they failed. We may be grateful to Providence that the Germans got the V1s and V2s late and in limited quantities, and even more grateful that they did not get the atomic bomb at all. The battle of the laboratories held fateful risks for us as well as the battles of the air, land, and sea. And we have now won the battle of the laboratories, as we have won the other battles. We are now prepared to obliterate more rapidly and completely every productive enterprise the Japanese have above ground in any city, said Harry Truman. We shall destroy their docks, their factories, and their communications. Let there be no mistake, we shall completely destroy Japan's power to make war. It was to spare, and so on. One of the books that Lily had brought Rumford was The Destruction of Dresden by an Englishman named David Irving. It was an American edition published by Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston in 1964. What Rumford wanted from it were portions of the forewords by his friends Ira C. Aker, Lieutenant General, USAF, retired, and British Air Marshal Sir Robert Sondby, KCB, KBE, MC, DFC, AFC. I find it difficult to understand Englishmen or Americans who weep about enemy civilians who were killed but who have not shed a tear for our gallant crews lost in combat with a cruel enemy, wrote his friend General Aker in part. I think it would have been well for Mr. Irving to have remembered, when he was drawing the frightful picture of the civilians killed at Dresden, that V-1s and V-2s were at that very time falling on England, killing civilian men, women, and children indiscriminately, as they were designed and launched to do. It might be well to remember Buchenwald and Coventry, too. Acres Forward ended this way. I deeply regret that British and U.S. bombers killed 135,000 people in the attack on Dresden. But I remember who started the last war, and I regret even more the loss of more than five million Allied lives in the necessary effort to completely defeat and utterly destroy Nazism. So it goes. What Air Marshal Sondby said, among other things, was this, that the bombing of Dresden was a great tragedy none can deny, that it was really a military necessity few, after reading this book, will believe. 
It was one of those terrible things that sometimes happen in wartime, brought about by an unfortunate combination of circumstances. Those who approved it were neither wicked nor cruel, though it may well be that they were too remote from the harsh realities of war to understand fully the appalling destructive power of air bombardment in the spring of 1945. The advocates of nuclear disarmament seemed to believe that if they could achieve their aim, war would become tolerable and decent. They would do well to read this book and ponder the fate of Dresden, where 135,000 people died as the result of an air attack with conventional weapons. On the night of March 9, 1945, an air attack on Tokyo by American heavy bombers using incendiary and high-explosive bombs caused the death of 83,793 people. The atom bomb dropped on Hiroshima killed 71,379 people. So it goes. If you're ever in Cody, Wyoming, said Billy Pilgrim behind his white linen screens, just ask for Wild Bob. Lily Rumford shuddered, went on pretending to read the Harry Truman thing. Billy's daughter Barbara came in later that day. She was all doped up, had the same glassy-eyed look that poor old Edgar Derby wore just before he was shot in Dresden. Doctors had given her pills so she could continue to function, even though her father was broken and her mother was dead. So it goes. She was accompanied by a doctor and a nurse. Her brother Robert was flying home from a battlefield in Vietnam. Daddy, she said tentatively. Daddy? But Billy was ten years away, back in 1958. He was examining the eyes of a young male Mongolian idiot in order to prescribe corrective lenses. The idiot's mother was there, acting as an interpreter. How many dots do you see? Billy Pilgrim asked him. And then Billy traveled in time to when he was 16 years old, in the waiting room of a doctor. Billy had an infected thumb. There was only one other patient waiting, an old, old man. The old man was in agony because of gas. He farted tremendously, and then he belched. Excuse me, he said to Billy, and then he did it again. Oh, God, he said. I knew it was going to be bad getting old, he shook his head. I didn't know it was going to be this bad. Billy Pilgrim opened his eyes in the hospital in Vermont, did not know where he was. Watching him was his son, Robert. Robert was wearing the uniform of the famous Green Berets. Robert's hair was short, was wheat-colored bristles. Robert was clean and neat. He was decorated with a purple heart and a silver star and a bronze star with two clusters. This was a boy who had flunked out of high school, who had been an alcoholic at 16, who had run with a rotten bunch of kids, who had been arrested for tipping over hundreds of tombstones in a Catholic cemetery one time. He was all straightened out now. His posture was wonderful, and his shoes were shined, and his trousers were pressed, and he was a leader of men. Dad? Billy Pilgrim closed his eyes again. Billy had to miss his wife's funeral because he was still so sick. He was conscious, though, while Valencia was being put into the ground in Ilium. Billy hadn't said much since regaining consciousness, hadn't responded very elaborately to the news of Valencia's death and Robert's coming home from the war and so on. So it was generally believed that he was a vegetable, there was talk of performing an operation on him later, one which might improve the circulation of blood to his brain. Actually, Billy's outward listlessness was a screen. The listlessness concealed a mind which was fizzing and flashing thrillingly. It was preparing letters and lectures about the flying saucers, the negligibility of death, and the true nature of time. 
Professor Rumford said frightful things about Billy within Billy's hearing, confident that Billy no longer had any brain at all. Why don't they let him die? He asked Lily. I don't know, she said. That's not a human being anymore. Doctors are for human beings. They should turn him over to a veterinarian or a tree surgeon. They'd know what to do. Look at him. That's life, according to the medical profession. Isn't life wonderful? I don't know, said Lily. Rumford talked to Lily about the bombing of Dresden one time, and Billy heard it all. Rumford had a problem about Dresden. His one-volume history of the Army Air Force in World War II was supposed to be a readable condensation of the 27-volume official history of the Army Air Force in World War II. The thing was, though, there was almost nothing in the 27 volumes about the Dresden Raid, even though it had been such a howling success. The extent of the success had been kept a secret for many years after the war, a secret from the American people. It was no secret from the Germans, of course, or from the Russians, who occupied Dresden after the war, who are in Dresden still. Americans have finally heard about Dresden, said Rumford, 23 years after the raid. A lot of them know how much worse it was than Hiroshima, so I've got to put something about it in my book from the official Air Force standpoint. It'll all be new. Why would they keep it a secret so long, said Lily. For fear that a lot of bleeding hearts, said Rumford, might not think it was such a wonderful thing to do. It was now that Billy Pilgrim spoke up intelligently. I was there, he said. It was difficult for Rumford to take Billy seriously, since Rumford had so long considered Billy a repulsive non-person who would be much better off dead. Now, with Billy speaking clearly and to the point, Rumford's ears wanted to treat the words as a foreign language that was not worth learning. What did he say? said Rumford. Lily had to serve as an interpreter. He said he was there, she explained. He was where? I don't know, said Lily. Where were you? she asked Billy. Dresden, said Billy. Dresden, Lily told Rumford. He's simply echoing things we say, said Rumford. Oh, said Lily. He's got echolalia now. Oh, Echolalia is a mental disease which makes people immediately repeat things that well people around them say. But Billy didn't really have it. Rumford simply insisted for his own comfort that Billy had it. Rumford was thinking in a military manner that an inconvenient person, one whose death he wished for very much, for practical reasons, was suffering from a repulsive disease. Rumford went on insisting for several hours that Billy had echolalia, told nurses and a doctor that Billy had echolalia now. Some experiments were performed on Billy. Doctors and nurses tried to get Billy to echo something, but Billy wouldn't make a sound for them. He isn't doing it now, said Rumford peevishly. The minute you go away, he'll start doing it again. Nobody took Rumford's diagnosis seriously. The staff thought Rumford was a hateful old man, conceited and cruel. He often said to them, in one way or another, that people who were weak deserved to die, whereas the staff, of course, was devoted to the idea that weak people should be helped as much as possible, that nobody should die. There, in the hospital, Billy was having an adventure very common among people without power in time of war. He was trying to prove to a willfully deaf and blind enemy that he was interesting to hear and see. He kept silent until the lights went out at night, and then, when there had been a long period of silence containing nothing to echo, he said to Rumford, I was in Dresden when it was bombed. I was a prisoner of war. Rumford sighed impatiently. Word of honor, said Billy Pilgrim. Do you believe me? Must we talk about it now, said Rumford. He had heard. He didn't believe. We don't ever have to talk about it, 
said Billy. I just want you to know I was there. Nothing more was said about Dresden that night, and Billy closed his eyes, traveled in time to a May afternoon two days after the end of the Second World War in Europe. Billy and five other American prisoners were riding in a coffin-shaped green wagon, which they had found abandoned, complete with two horses, in a suburb of Dresden. Now they were being drawn by the clop, clop, clopping horses down narrow lanes which had been cleared through the moon-like ruins. They were going back to the slaughterhouse for souvenirs of the war. Billy was reminded of the sounds of milkmen's horses early in the morning in Ilium when he was a boy. Billy sat in the back of the jiggling coffin. His head was tilted back and his nostrils were flaring. He was happy. He was warm. There was food in the wagon and wine and a camera and a stamp collection and a stuffed owl and a mantle clock that ran on changes of barometric pressure. The Americans had gone into empty houses in the suburb where they had been imprisoned and they had taken these and many other things. The owners, hearing that the Russians were coming, killing and robbing and raping and burning, had fled. But the Russians hadn't come yet, even two days after the war. It was peaceful in the ruins. Billy saw only one other person on the way to the slaughterhouse. It was an old man pushing a baby buggy. In the buggy were pots and cups and an umbrella frame and other things he had found. Billy stayed in the wagon when it reached the slaughterhouse, sunning himself. The others went looking for souvenirs. Later on in life, the Tralfamadorians would advise Billy to concentrate on the happy moments in his life and to ignore the unhappy ones, to stare only at pretty things as eternity failed to go by. If this sort of selectivity had been possible for Billy, he might have chosen as his happiest moment his sun-drenched snooze in the back of the wagon. Billy Pilgrim was armed as he snoozed, it was the first time he had been armed since basic training. His companions had insisted that he arm himself since God only knew what sorts of killers might be in the burrows on the face of the moon. Wild dogs, packs of rats fattened on corpses, escaped maniacs and murderers, soldiers who would never quit killing until they themselves were killed. Billy had a tremendous cavalry pistol in his belt. It was a relic of World War I. It had a ring in its butt. It was loaded with bullets the size of robin's eggs. Billy had found it in the bedside table in a house. That was one of the things about the end of the war. Absolutely anybody who wanted a weapon could have one. They were lying all around. Billy had a saber, too. It was a Luftwaffe ceremonial saber. Its hilt was stamped with a screaming eagle. The eagle was carrying a swastika and looking down. Billy found it stuck into a telephone pole. He had pulled it out of the pole as the wagon went by. Now his snoozing became shallower as he heard a man and a woman speaking German in pitying tones. The speakers were commiserating with somebody lyrically. Before Billy opened his eyes, it seemed to him that the tones might have been those used by the friends of Jesus when they took his ruined body down from his cross. So it goes. Billy opened his eyes. A middle-aged man and wife were crooning to the horses. They were noticing what the Americans had not noticed, that the horses' mouths were bleeding, gashed by the bits, that the horses' hooves were broken, so that every step meant agony that the horses were insane with thirst. The Americans had treated their form of transportation as though it were no more sensitive than a six-cylinder Chevrolet. These two horse pitiers moved back along the wagon to where they could gaze in patronizing reproach at Billy, at Billy Pilgrim, who was so long and weak, so ridiculous in his azure toga and silver shoes. They weren't afraid of him. They weren't afraid of anything. They were doctors, 
both obstetricians. They had been delivering babies until the hospitals were all burned down. Now they were picnicking near where their apartment used to be. The woman was softly beautiful, translucent from having eaten potatoes for so long. The man wore a business suit, necktie and all. Potatoes had made him gaunt. He was as tall as Billy, wore steel rim trifocals. This couple, so involved with babies, had never reproduced themselves, though they could have. This was an interesting comment on the whole idea of reproduction. They had nine languages between them. They tried Polish on Billy Pilgrim first, since he was dressed so clownishly, since the wretched Poles were the involuntary clowns of the Second World War. Billy asked them in English what it was they wanted, and they at once scolded him in English for the condition of the horses. They made Billy get out of the wagon and come look at the horses. When Billy saw the condition of his means of transportation, he burst into tears. He hadn't cried about anything else in the war. Later on, as a middle-aged optometrist, he would weep quietly and privately sometimes, but never make loud boo-hooing noises. Which is why the epigraph of this book is the quatrain from the famous Christmas Carol. Billy cried very little, though he often saw things worth crying about, and in that respect, at least, he resembled the Christ of the Carol. The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes, but the little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Billy traveled in time back to the hospital in Vermont. Breakfast had been eaten and cleared away, and Professor Rumford was reluctantly becoming interested in Billy as a human being. Rumford questioned Billy gruffly, satisfied himself that Billy really had been in Dresden. He asked Billy what it had been like, and Billy told him about the horses and the couple picnicking on the moon. The story ended this way. Billy and the doctors unharnessed the horses, but the horses wouldn't go anywhere. Their feet hurt too much. And then Russians came on motorcycles, and they arrested everybody but the horses. Two days after that, Billy was turned over to the Americans, who shipped him home on a very slow freighter called the Lucretia A. Mott. Lucretia A. Mott was a famous American suffragette. She was dead. So it goes. It had to be done, Rumford told Billy, speaking of the destruction of Dresden. I know, said Billy. That's war. I know, I'm not complaining. It must have been hell on the ground. It was, said Billy Pilgrim. Pity the men who had to do it. I do. You must have mixed feelings there on the ground. It was all right, said Billy. Everything is all right, and everybody has to do exactly what he does. I learned that on Trofamador. Billy Pilgrim's daughter took him home later that day, put him to bed in his house, turned the magic fingers on. There was a practical nurse there. Billy wasn't supposed to work or even leave the house for a while, at least. He was under observation. But Billy sneaked out while the nurse wasn't watching, and he drove to New York City, where he hoped to appear on television. He was going to tell the world about the lessons of Trofamador. Billy Pilgrim checked into the Royalton Hotel on 44th Street in New York. He, by chance, was given a room which had once been the home of George Jean Nathan, the critic and editor. Nathan, according to the earthling concept of time, had died back in 1958. According to the Trofamadorian concept, of course, Nathan was still alive somewhere and always would be. The room was small and simple, except that it was on the top floor and had French doors which opened onto a terrace as large as the room. And beyond the parapet of the terrace was the airspace over 44th Street, Billy now leaned over that parapet, looked down at all the people moving hither and yon. 
They were jerky little scissors. They were a lot of fun. It was a chilly night, and Billy came indoors after a while, closed the French doors. Closing those doors reminded him of his honeymoon. There had been French doors on the Cape Ann love nest of his honeymoon, still were, always would be. Billy turned on his television set, clicking its channel selector around and around. He was looking for programs on which he might be allowed to appear. But it was too early in the evening for programs that allowed people with peculiar opinions to speak out. It was only a little after eight o'clock, so all the shows were about silliness or murder. So it goes. Billy left his room, went down the slow elevator, walked over to Times Square, looked into the window of a tawdry bookstore. In the window were hundreds of books about fucking and buggery and murder, and a street guide to New York City, and a model of the Statue of Liberty with a thermometer on it. Also in the window, speckled with soot and fly shit, were four paperback novels by Billy's friend, Kilgore Trout. The news of the day, meanwhile, was being written in a ribbon of lights on a building to Billy's back. The window reflected the news. It was about power and sports and anger and death. So it goes. Billy went into the bookstore. A sign in there said that adults only were allowed in the back. There were peep shows in the back that showed movies of young women and men with no clothes on. It cost a quarter to look into a machine for one minute. There were still photographs of naked young people for sale back there, too. You could take those home. The stills were a lot more Tralfamadorian than the movies, since you could look at them whenever you wanted to, and they wouldn't change. Twenty years in the future... Those girls would still be young, would still be smiling or smoldering or simply looking stupid with their legs wide open. Some of them were eating lollipops or bananas. They would still be eating those, and the peckers of the young men would still be semi-erect, and their muscles would be bulging like cannonballs. But Billy Pilgrim wasn't beguiled by the back of the store. He was thrilled by the Kilgore Trout novels in the front. The titles were all new to him, or he thought they were. Now he opened one. It seemed all right for him to do that. Everybody else in the store was pawing things. The name of the book was The Big Board. He got a few paragraphs into it and then realized that he had read it before, years ago, in the Veterans Hospital. It was about an earthling man and woman who were kidnapped by extraterrestrials. They were put on display in a zoo on a planet called Zircon 212. These fictitious people in the zoo had a big board supposedly showing stock market quotations and commodity prices along one wall of their habitat and a news ticker and a telephone that was supposedly connected to a brokerage on Earth. The creatures on Zircon 212 told their captives that they had invested a million dollars for them back on Earth, that it was up to the captives to manage it so they would be fabulously wealthy when they were returned to Earth. The telephone and the big board and the ticker were all fakes, of course. They were simply stimulants to make the earthlings perform vividly for the crowds at the zoo, to make them jump up and down and cheer or gloat or sulk or tear their hair, to be scared shitless or to feel as contented as babies in their mother's arms. The earthlings did very well on paper. That was part of the rigging, of course. And religion got mixed up in it, too. The news ticker reminded them that the President of the United States had declared National Prayer Week and that everybody should pray. The earthlings had had a bad week on the market before that. They had lost a small fortune in olive oil futures, so they gave praying a whirl. 
it worked. Olive oil went up. Another Kilgore Trout book there in the window was about a man who built a time machine so he could go back and see Jesus. It worked, and he saw Jesus when Jesus was only 12 years old. Jesus was learning the carpentry trade from his father. Two Roman soldiers came into the shop with a mechanical drawing on papyrus of a device they wanted built by sunrise the next morning. It was a cross to be used in the execution of a rabble-rouser. Jesus and his father built it. They were glad to have the work, and the rabble-rouser was executed on it. So it goes. The bookstore was run by seeming quintuplets, by five short, bald men chewing unlit cigars that were sopping wet. They never smiled and each one had a stool to perch on. They were making money running a paper and celluloid whorehouse. They didn't have hard-ons. Neither did Billy Pilgrim. Everybody else did. It was a ridiculous store, all about love and babies. The clerks occasionally told somebody to buy or get out, not to just look and look and look and paw and paw. Some of the people were looking at each other, instead of the merchandise. A clerk came up to Billy and told him the good stuff was in the back, that the books Billy was reading were window dressing. That ain't what you want, for Christ's sake, he told Billy. What you want's in back. So Billy moved a little farther back, but not as far as the part for adults only. He moved because of absent-minded politeness, taking a trout book with him, the one about Jesus and the time machine. The time traveler in the book went back to Bible times to find out one thing in particular, whether or not Jesus had really died on the cross, or whether he had been taken down while still alive, whether he had really gone on living. The hero had a stethoscope along. Billy skipped to the end of the book, where the hero mingled with the people who were taking Jesus down from the cross. The time traveler was the first one up the ladder, dressed in clothes of the period, and he leaned close to Jesus so people couldn't see him use the stethoscope, and he listened. There wasn't a sound inside the emaciated chest cavity. The Son of God was dead as a doornail. So it goes. The time traveler, whose name was Lance Corwin, also got to measure the length of Jesus, but not to weigh him. Jesus was five feet and three and a half inches long. Another clerk came up to Billy and asked him if he was going to buy the book or not, and Billy said that he wanted to buy it, please. He had his back to a rack of paperback books about oral genital contacts from ancient Egypt to the present and so on and the clerk supposed Billy was reading one of these, so he was startled when he saw what Billy's book was. He said, Jesus Christ, where did you find this thing? And so on. And he had to tell the other clerks about the pervert who wanted to buy the window dressing. The other clerks already knew about Billy. They had been watching him too. The cash register where Billy waited for his change was near a bin of old girly magazines. Billy looked at one out of the corner of his eye, and he saw this question on its cover. What really became of Montana Wild Hack? So Billy read it. He knew where Montana Wild Hack really was, of course. She was back on Tralfamador, taking care of the baby, but the magazine which was called Midnight Pussycats, promised that she was wearing a cement overcoat under 30 fathoms of salt water in San Pedro Bay. So it goes. Billy wanted to laugh. The magazine, which was published for lonesome men to jerk off to, ran the story so it could print pictures taken from blue movies which Montana had made as a teenager. Billy did not look closely at these. They were grainy things, soot and chalk. They could have been anybody. 
Billy was again directed to the back of the store, and he went this time. A jaded sailor stepped away from the movie machine while the film was still running. Billy looked in, and there was Montana Wild Hack, alone in a bed, peeling a banana. The picture clicked off. Billy did not want to see what happened next, and the clerk importuned him to come over and see some really hot stuff they kept under the counter for connoisseurs. Billy was mildly curious as to what could possibly have been kept hidden in such a place. The clerk leered and showed him. It was a photograph of a woman and a Shetland pony. They were attempting to have sexual intercourse between two Doric columns in front of velvet draperies, which were fringed with deedly balls. Billy didn't get onto television in New York that night, but he did get onto a radio talk show. There was a radio station right next to Billy's hotel. He saw its call letters over the entrance of an office building, so he went in. He went up to the studio on an automatic elevator, and there were other people up there waiting to go in. They were literary critics, and they thought Billy was one too. They were going to discuss whether the novel was dead or not. So it goes. Billy took his seat with the others around a golden oak table with a microphone all his own. The master of ceremonies asked him his name and what paper he was from. Billy said he was from the Ilium Gazette. He was nervous and happy. If you're ever in Cody, Wyoming, he told himself, just ask for Wild Bob. Billy put his hand up at the very first part of the program, but he wasn't called on right away. Others got in ahead of him. One of them said that it would be a nice time to bury the novel, now that a Virginian, 100 years after Appomattox, had written Uncle Tom's Cabin. Another one said that people couldn't read well enough anymore to turn print into exciting situations in their skulls, so that authors had to do what Norman Mailer did, which was to perform in public what he had written. The master of ceremonies asked people to say what they thought the function of the novel might be in modern society, and one critic said, to provide touches of color in rooms with all white walls. Another one said, to describe blowjobs artistically, another one said, to teach wives of junior executives what to buy next and how to act in a French restaurant. And then Billy was allowed to speak. Off he went, in that beautifully trained voice of his, telling about the flying saucers and Montana wild hack and so on. He was gently expelled from the studio during a commercial, he went back to his hotel room, put a quarter into the Magic Fingers machine connected to his bed, and he went to sleep. He traveled in time back to Tralfamador. Time traveling again, said Montana. It was artificial evening in the dome. She was breastfeeding their child. Hmm, said Billy. You've been time traveling again. I can always tell. Where did you go this time? It wasn't the war. I can tell that, too. New York. The Big Apple. Hmm? That's what they used to call New York. Oh. You see any plays or movies? No. I walked around Times Square some. Bought a book by Kilgore Trout. Lucky you. She did not share his enthusiasm for Kilgore Trout. Billy mentioned casually that he had seen part of a blue movie she had made. Her response was no less casual. It was Tralfamadorian and guilt-free. Yes, she said, and I've heard about you in the war, about what a clown you were, and I've heard about the high school teacher who was shot. He made a blue movie with a firing squad. She moved the baby from one breast to the other because the moment was so structured that she had to do so. There was a silence. They're playing with the clocks again, said Montana, rising, preparing to put the baby into its crib. She meant that their keepers were making the electric clocks in the dome go fast, then slow, then fast again, and watching the little earthling family through peepholes. 
there was a silver chain around Montana Wild Hack's neck. Hanging from it, between her breasts, was a locket containing a photograph of her alcoholic mother, a grainy thing, soot and chalk. It could have been anybody. Engraved on the outside of the locket were these words. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom always to tell the difference. Robert Kennedy, whose summer home is eight miles from the home I live in all year round, was shot two nights ago. He died last night. So it goes. Martin Luther King was shot a month ago. He died too. So it goes. And every day my government gives me a count of corpses created by military science in Vietnam. So it goes. My father died many years ago now of natural causes. So it goes. He was a sweet man. He was a gun nut too. He left me his guns. They rust. On Tralfamador, says Billy Pilgrim, there isn't much interest in Jesus Christ. The earthling figure who is most engaging to the Tralfamadorian mind, he says, is Charles Darwin, who taught that those who die are meant to die, that corpses are improvements. So it goes. The same general idea appears in The Big Board by Kilgore Trout. The flying saucer creatures who capture Trout's hero ask him about Darwin. They also ask him about golf. If what Billy Pilgrim learned from the Tralfamadorians is true, that we will all live forever, no matter how dead we may sometimes seem to be, I am not overjoyed. Still, if I'm going to spend eternity visiting this moment and that, I am grateful that so many of those moments are nice. One of the nicest ones in recent times was on my trip back to Dresden with my old war buddy, O'Hare. We took a Hungarian Airlines plane from East Berlin. The pilot had a handlebar mustache. He looked like Adolf Manju. He smoked a Cuban cigar while the plane was being fueled. When we took off, there was no talk of fastening seatbelts. When we were up in the air, a young steward served us rye bread and salami and butter and cheese and white wine. The folding tray in front of me would not open out. The steward went into the cockpit for a tool, came back with a beer can opener. He used it to pry out the tray. There were only six other passengers. They spoke many languages. They were having nice times, too. East Germany was down below, and the lights were on. I imagine dropping bombs on those lights, those villages and cities and towns. O'Hare and I had never expected to make any money, and here we were now, extremely well-to-do. If you're ever in Cody, Wyoming, I said to him lazily, just ask for Wild Bob. O'Hare had a little notebook with him, and printed in the back of it were postal rates and airline distances and the altitudes of famous mountains and other key facts about the world. He was looking up the population of Dresden, which wasn't in the notebook, when he came across this, which he gave me to read. On an average, 324,000 new babies are born into the world every day. During that same day, 10,000 persons, on an average, will have starved to death or died from malnutrition. So it goes. In addition, 123,000 persons will die for other reasons. So it goes. This leaves a net gain of about 191,000 each day in the world. The Population Reference Bureau predicts that the world's total population will double to 7 billion before the year 2000. I suppose they will all want dignity, I said. I suppose 
said O'Hare. Billy Pilgrim was meanwhile traveling back to Dresden, too, but not in the present. He was going back there in 1945, two days after the city was destroyed. Now Billy and the rest were being marched into the ruins by their guards. I was there. O'Hare was there. We had spent the past two nights in the blind innkeeper's stable. Authorities had found us there. They told us what to do. We were to borrow picks and shovels and crowbars and wheelbarrows from our neighbors. We were to march with these implements to such and such a place in the ruins, ready to go to work. There were barricades in the main roads leading into the ruins. Germans were stopped there. They were not permitted to explore the moon. Prisoners of war from many lands came together that morning at such and such a place in Dresden. It had been decreed that here was where the digging for bodies was to begin. So the digging began. Billy found himself paired as a digger with a Maori who had been captured at Tobruk. The Maori was chocolate brown. He had whirlpools tattooed on his forehead and his cheeks. Billy and the Maori dug into the inert, unpromising gravel of the moon. The materials were loose, so there were constant little avalanches. Many holes were dug at once. Nobody knew yet what there was to find. Most holes came to nothing, to pavement, or to boulders so huge they would not move. There was no machinery. Not even horses or mules or oxen could cross the moonscape and Billy and the Maori and others helping them with their particular hole came at last to a membrane of timbers laced over rocks which had wedged together to form an accidental dome. They made a hole in the membrane. There was darkness and space under there. A German soldier with a flashlight went down into the darkness, was gone a long time, when he finally came back, he told a superior on the rim of the hole that there were dozens of bodies down there. They were sitting on benches. They were unmarked. So it goes. The superior said that the opening in the membrane should be enlarged and that a ladder should be put in the hole so that the bodies could be carried out. Thus began the first corpse mine in Dresden. There were hundreds of corpse mines operating by and by. They didn't smell bad at first, were wax museums. But then the bodies rotted and liquefied, and the stink was like roses and mustard gas. So it goes. The Maori Billy had worked with died of the dry heaves after having been ordered to go down in that stink and work, he tore himself to pieces, throwing up and throwing up. So it goes. So a new technique was devised. Bodies weren't brought up anymore. They were cremated by soldiers with flamethrowers right where they were. The soldiers stood outside the shelters, simply sent the fire in, Somewhere in there, the poor old high school teacher, Edgar Derby, was caught with a teapot he had taken from the catacombs. He was arrested for plundering. He was tried and shot. And somewhere in there was springtime. The corpse mines were closed down. The soldiers all left to fight the Russians. In the suburbs, the women and children dug rifle pits, Billy and the rest of his group were locked up in the stable in the suburbs. And then, one morning, they got up to discover that the door was unlocked. World War II in Europe was over. Billy and the rest wandered out into the shady street. The trees were leafing out. There was nothing going on out there. No traffic of any kind. 
there was only one vehicle, an abandoned wagon drawn by two horses. The wagon was green and coffin-shaped. Birds were talking. One bird said to Billy Pilgrim, Pooty Wheat? A lot of people uh, think that I was Billy Pilgrim, and in the book I describe him as not looking like a soldier at all, looking like a filthy flamingo. <laughs> but no, I was a pretty good soldier, and uh, I was a battalion scout, intelligence reconnaissance scout, and there were six of us in each battalion. And uh, 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 we were roaming out in front of the front line all the time trying to find out who was out there and uh, so when they, when our division surrendered the order came down that our division had surrendered which I am told was the largest surrender of men still under arms in military history with the possible exception of the surrender of Robert E. Lee <laughs> at Appomattox anyway rather than surrender it's the six of us kept walking kept going roaming, and uh, uh, the, the Germans finally caught us. And uh, But Billy Pilgrim was a guy who, who did look like a filthy flamingo and never should have been in the Army, and God knows not in the infantry. And his name was Edward Crone, and he died in Dresden. He died of the Thousand Mile Stair, which is where he just sat with his back to the wall would not talk, would not accept food, and uh, uh, the Germans would do nothing to help him, and uh, so he died. And he was buried in Dresden, and when the war was over, his parents came to Dresden looking for his grave. And, uh, you know, you can say what you want about the Germans. They keep good records. <laughs> and they were able to find Edward Crone grave, and so he's buried in Rochester, New York, which is his hometown, and uh, I have visited his grave, and I've spoken to his grave, and uh, I contribute money to that particular cemetery. Edward Crone was the name of Billy Pilgrim, and uh, he just didn't understand the war at all and what was going on, and of course there was nothing to understand. He was right. It was a utter gibberish. I'm Donald Farber Kurtz, longtime friend and attorney. For the last 50 years, you've been telling me I'm a coward because I didn't get caught. You know, I was over there fighting that war, too. Yeah, you but still you still think I'm a coward? You didn't know enough German to surrender. <laughs> <laughs> You're right about that. Yeah. You learn it pretty fast, though, don't you? Yeah, but I actually saw Germans. I'm not sure whether you did or not. Yeah, I saw a few. <laughs> you know that. It wasn't much fun. Yeah. I didn't speak very good German, either. But it, uh, it really was something, and I think... My division, which was a green division, came in the line, 15,000 of us uh, protecting an unimportant 75 miles. That's a lot. And, and no attack was expected. And But I suspect that one was. Is I think we were baiting a trap. Because we had practically no ammunition. Uh, uh, we didn't have proper winter clothing yet. And... The, uh, when the Germans attacked, you, see, they, you know, we were fighting in the snow or surrendering in the snow or whatever, and the Germans were wearing white capes, and uh, we should have had those too. As, as it is, we were wearing uh, uniforms the color of dog poop, and you know what that <laughs> looks like in the snow. Did, it's easy did you have to any spot. Problem, <laughs> did you have any problem keeping straight who was who? We did we oh, you mean whether most they were? The time. Yeah, most of the time we didn't know who we were. Who no, we were no. Shooting well, at. the Germans were were wearing American uniforms often. It was a problem. And uh, ac actually, at crossroads, being MPs direct <laughs> <laughs> directing traffic. The penalty for that, incidentally, is death. Oh. 
if, if, if you get caught. Yes. Uh, but all the guys who knocked the hell out of us and, and out of uh, a division a regiment on either of our front flanks, uh, they were very soon killed or captured themselves. The war was nearly over. But you, your, your company was largely... It, it wasn't uh, decimated like my company. It was well, My company was wiped out, yeah. the entire company. Well, we we didn't have time enough to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I guess... Uh, Incidentally, I, is uh, you and TV newscasters and all kinds of other chowderheads <laughs> are always using the word decimate. That means one person in ten. Is that, those are the casualties your division suffered? No, actually, I don't know about the division. I know the company was wiped out. All right. Well, they were a hell of a lot more than decimated. Yeah, they were they? wiped out. Yeah. That means every one of them, yeah. except two of us. I was yeah. lucky enough to be called back to division headquarters two weeks before they were wiped out, and the yeah. other one was in the hospital yeah. recovering. Uh, the book came out of this, though. That's really what this is about. Yes, well, I got lucky, and I wouldn't have missed it for the world in what I've said and, and never been challenged on it about it. Incidentally, the firebombing of Dresden is the burning of the thing to the ground. Uh, was a British idea, not an American idea, and it, it was their night bombers. They bombed at night. We bombed in the daytime. And uh, I, it was an experiment to see if you could turn a city into a single column of flame, which they did. Of course, the British were the ones who were running for the uh, cover every night. It, <clears throat> yes. well, they, they, they were the ones that were getting uh, hit. We didn't get hit at yeah. home. But the, uh, well, the air marshal of, of the Royal Air Force is Bomber Harris. I forget what his first name is. Lord Harris, I believe. But of the British marshals of one kind or another, and I think there were four or five of them. He was the only one who didn't get a VC when the war was over. And uh, when, I don't know, about ten years ago, it was proposed that a statue of him be put on Trafalgar Square or somewhere like that, uh, a whole lot of RAF guys protested because they were ashamed and, well, it should have been. What I have said about the firebombing of Dresden, that not one person got out of a concentration camp a microsecond earlier. Not one German deserted his defensive position one microsecond earlier. Only one person on the whole face of the earth benefited from the firebombing of Dresden. And that's me. And I got, <laughs> I got $5 for every person killed. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, it's a monumental book. Uh, well, I hope. Yeah, well, it's made its impression. And the nice thing about all your writing, I keep telling everybody of the writers who are alive today that are popular, you're one of the very few that's uh, 100% in print. And the reason, uh, I'm sure the reason is because what you write is multi-generational. Well, I, I know grandchildren, children, and parents and yeah. grandparents are reading you. But you know... It, uh, it is surely no bad thing to be just a dynamite writer for your own generation. That's it, as the future may not be interested. Uh, but that is quite something to do. And in a large measure, Ernest Hemingway was such a writer. Is he really wowed his contemporaries, and they were properly wowed. And uh, he isn't much read now. But you are. Yes, but I just got lucky, and uh, uh, it might have something to do with the writing, Kurt. Might have something to do with the subject matter. It Sex. Might... <laughs> oh God, we're going into that now. <laughs> there's, yeah, yeah, there's a little sex in there, but it's also the themes are are um, themes that are pretty uh, for for all time, and and they're important themes. Well, it's it's all right if they're not. If if they are okay for three years, that's not a bad thing to do. I know you don't like to meddle in the movies <clears throat> when they buy the rights and they yeah. go to make the movie, but uh, I and you say the book's going to stand up no matter what happens with the movie. But well, Slaughterhouse was a great movie. Yes, Slaughterhouse. Slaughterhouse is one of the greats. Well, I I have said that there are two novelists that ought to be eternally grateful to Hollywood. Uh, I'm one of them, and Margaret Mitchell is the other one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, Gone with the Wind is also. <laughs> a hell of a good movie, I must say. Well, I think maybe your director helped. 
<laughs> with his little slaughterhouse. Yes, and it was interesting. That was George Roy Hill, yeah. uh, and the late George Roy Hill, as he died about six months ago now. Uh, but he was, in fact, a hawk and had been a fighter pilot in, in the Second World War, uh, uh, a tactical fighter pilot for the Marines. And uh, then I think in uh, in Korea again, and he had a crew cut and all that, but he made one of the great pacifist yeah. movies of all time. Is it true, Kurt, that he would ask your questions and then do what he damn pleased? Yes. He would ask my <laughs> advice. He never <laughs> took any of it. Not only that. That may, it may have been good in this instance. The yeah. movie turned out a No, it was worse piece than that. I was actually in several scenes, and he cut me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll take it back. <laughs> Billy Pilgrim could not sleep on his daughter's wedding night. He was 44. The wedding had taken place that afternoon in a gaily striped tent in Billy's backyard. The stripes were orange and black. Billy padded downstairs on his blue and ivory feet. He went into the kitchen where the moonlight called his attention to a half bottle of champagne on the kitchen table, all that was left from the reception in the tent. Somebody had stoppered it again. Drink me, it seemed to say. So Billy uncorked it with his thumbs. Didn't make a pop. The champagne was dead. So it goes. He went into the living room, swinging the bottle like a dinner bell. Turned on the television. He came slightly unstuck in time. Saw the late movie backwards. Then forwards again, then forwards again, then forwards again. It was a movie about American bombers in the Second World War and the gallant men who flew them. He came slightly unstuck in time. Seen backwards by Billy, the story went like this. Some of the bombers were in bad repair, 
Over France, though, German fighter planes came up again, made everything and everybody as good as new. When the bombers got back to their base, the steel cylinders were taken from the racks and shipped back to the United States of America, where factories were operating night and day, dismantling the cylinders, separating the dangerous contents into minerals. Touchingly, it was mainly women who did this work. in remote areas. It was their business to put them into the ground to hide them cleverly so they would never hurt anybody ever again. turned in their uniforms, became high school kids. And Hitler turned into a baby, Billy Pilgrim supposed. That wasn't in the movie. Billy was extrapolating. Everybody turned into a baby, and all humanity, without exception, conspired biologically to produce two perfect people named Adam and Eve. So it goes. We hope you've enjoyed this program from Harper Audio. To order additional cassettes or CDs, or to receive a complete catalog of Harper Audio and Cadman titles, please call us at 1-800-331-3761. You might also try our website, www.harperaudio.com. Thank you.